Um, yes, so um, I will, I called my talk aspects of, or my tutorial aspects of ontology mediated querying because, well, the, the area is now quite broad, actually, there are very many topics that one could speak about. And I felt I don't want to start from the absolute basics because I will not get anywhere. So what I, what I did is I selected three relatively recent topics. One is a little bit older, but three relatively recent topics from ontology mediated querying. And I will try to speak about those. And I hope that uh, I will also be able to transport basic techniques uh, from the field uh, while I go along. Okay, and of course, um, feel free to, to interrupt me at any point. Uh, I'm happy to take questions at any time. Um, actually, much better to have questions than to have no questions for a tutorial. Yes, so uh, not sure how much, how familiar you are with ontologies. So let me start with just saying a few very general words about what they are. Um, they are. Uh, the main tool, I would say, in artificial intelligence for, for a structured representation of domain knowledge using a logical language. Um, so what you do, or what an ontology does, is it specifies a vocabulary of some application domain that you're interested in. In particular, it fixes the names of what we call concepts. You could also call it classes, or you could call it unary predicates unary relations, maybe, if you're a database person. Uh, maybe classes is the most intuitive word for this. There's a strong focus in many ontologies on describing classes, and also the, the names and arities of relations. So it's a bit like in this Gary Larson cartoon, uh, we label things with the class that they belong to here, like the house, uh, the shirt, the dog, and so on. Um, but it's more, of course, than just fixing a vocabulary or fixing a schema, probably, you should say, in a database. Uh, summer school. Um, it also interrelates the different concepts, uh, and in this way defines their semantics. Um, it defines the semantics by, by relating the concepts. So for example, in a, in a medical ontology, you might find a statement such as a heart is a muscular organ that is part of the circulatory system. Um, and then, well, the, the classes, the concepts that are involved here are heart, muscular organ, circulatory system, and the relations are, is, a, is part of. Um, no, they can be, so it, I will come back to that, okay? Let me jump right into a concrete example, which is, which is very, very simple and toy-like, and which does have only binary relations. Um, so let's maybe look at the domain of movies. Yes, here's an ontology. It only consists of one first order sentence. Uh, what does it say? It just says, uh, if something or somebody is a director, then he or she is a person who directed a movie. Okay. Uh, let's also take a query um, because we want to do ontology mediated querying, right? So the query is just give me all persons who directed a movie. Um, and now let's take a database. And what does the data say? It says, well, uh, Jim Jamush is a person who directed a movie, and that movie is done by law. And Wim Wenders is also a director. And now, well, in the classical, if you just take the database and the query in a standard classical database setting, it's relatively clear what answer you would get, right? Uh, the, only person who we know to have directed a movie is Jim Jamush, so that would be returned. Um, but now, of course, if you take into account also the image that is uh, formalized in the ontology, then we know that Wim Wenders must also be a person and that he must have directed a movie, some movie. We don't know its identity. Yeah, this object was introduced by the existential quantifier here in the ontology. Um, but of course, that fits the query where we are also not asked to return the movie, only the person. And so we would get Wim Wenders as uh, an additional uh, answer. And this is a general idea. You add uh, knowledge to your data by an ontology. And this helps you, for example, to get more complete answers to your queries if your data is incomplete. And this is something that we generally assume in this area, the data is incomplete and the ontology can add additional things on top. 
Okay, and then here's the whole thing in a, in a box. Um, that's the, the setup of ontology-mediated querying. Uh, we have a database, we have an ontology, we have a query that we want to answer. Um, and uh, well, then we are interested in those answers that logically follow from the database and the ontology taken together as a logical theory. You know, the database you just view as a ground theory. Uh, and you take it together with the ontology and you ask, okay, what does follow from that in the standard sense of, of well, first of all, logic, if you wish. Okay. Um, and then I should probably also tell you what queries we use. Well, there's still a lot I should tell you, but let me start with saying what queries we use. Um, typically very relatively inexpressive queries, because if you go to very expressive ones, you easily become undecidable, of course, in such a deduction, uh, logical consequence uh, setting here. So mostly people would use uh, conjunctive queries or union of conjunctive queries. Uh, and also very simple queries. Um, I will speak about those uh, every now and then in the tutorial, atomic queries. So these are just, just single unary relations that you want to query. Yeah? So remember I said that ontologies often focus a lot on classes. Uh, and in this context, uh, in our applications, actually these queries, I know they look ridiculously simple for, for most database persons, but they actually make a lot of sense if you have an ontology in the background. You can ask for all directors, all movies, stuff like that. And um, together with the ontology, even this kind of query is not trivial. Okay, and uh, what is then an ontology-mediated query? Well, um, I will take it to be a triple. Um, so it consists of an actual query, the small Q here, ontology mediated queries are you know, with a uh, big Q. Um, and it has the, the, the ontology, we take them together, so to speak. Um, and okay, I also include typically in my query directly the, the data schema. So uh, this is just the set of relation symbols that we are allowed to use in the data. The promise that our data will use only those. Uh, because the ontology can add, of course, this can be very useful in applications, the ontology can add additional symbols on top of those that you have in your data, and then you can query them, yeah? well, even though they don't occur explicitly in the data. So down here, I group things a little bit differently compared to up here, right? Here, the database and the ontology are together. Here, it's the ontology and the query. Um, and if you do this, then, uh, well, this looks much more familiar up here, yeah? Um, so now what we have is just a standard querying problem from, from the perspective of database theory. Uh, we have just a database and we have a query and the query happens to be a compound object, yes, but it's still just a standard query. Yeah? You put in a database and you get out answers and you can study it like any other query language, basically. Okay, um, so... Uh, why would you be interested in doing this? Just a few, or something like this, just a few uh, points on this. Well, you might want to add domain knowledge or background knowledge to incomplete data. That's what I already said, and it may result in more complete answers to your queries. Um, one instance, you could say, is knowledge graphs, something that is very, very popular at the moment, of course. You might view this as a very simple, lightweight form of ontology. Um, only meaning to say here that it fits the general framework that I'm, I'm looking at. Um, it is also used in, in data integration. So here the idea is a little bit different. You would have several data sources, not just one. I assume Diego will talk about this more uh, in the afternoon. Um, so, uh, and then the, 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 the data sources might have different diverging uh, vocabularies, schemas, yes. Um, and the ontology would uh, link them. It would provide a unified global schema on top of the many data sources. And through the logical statements in the ontology, you can link your global schema, your global vocabulary to that of the individual data sources. Oh, okay, and you can even use it in other things. Good. Uh, one more thing I need is, uh, of course, I need uh, to fix an ontology language if I want to do ontology-mediated querying. And sometimes it may be useful to, uh, to consider full first order logic uh, or even extension, but mostly the focus is on uh, decidable logics, by which I mean at least the satisfiability problem of your logic should be decidable. Uh, otherwise, the querying problems that we're interested in 
will also not be decidable. Um, an important option are description logics. Um, those are prominent, uh, for example, I mean, they have a quite a tradition in knowledge representation, uh, for one thing, and also uh, they are quite prominent because they have been standardized by the uh, World Wide Web Committee as an ontology language for, for the web. OWL, I guess you've heard about it, and uh, description logics are well, it's not just one description logic, not the description logic, but it's a large family. I will introduce a description logic uh, in a second, a concrete one. Um, I suppose Diego in the afternoon will use quite, quite different description logics uh, than me, so I think you will probably see a few of them today. And uh, going back to, oh, well, well maybe one more uh, thing. Um, also, rule languages um, have become quite popular as ontology languages. Um, so these go under different names. The most, the most traditional name probably for, for database series, double generating dependencies. If you use them as an ontology, they would also be called existential rules or data loss plus or minus. I will also do that in this talk. And now coming back to the arity question, um, so it depends on which ontology language you, you choose, of course. Description logics traditionally only have arities one and two, uh, whereas, of course, uh, the other options uh, have uh, unbounded arities, unrestricted arities. OK, so let me introduce a concrete description logic, a very basic one uh, from my perspective uh, that is called uh, ALC. Um, Description logics come with their own syntax. Um, might like them or not. Uh, might like the syntax or not. Um, but I'm I'm going to give you the the original thing. So um, first, let me say that uh, I already said we have only unary and binary relations available here. And typically, we will refer to unary relations in this area as concept names and to binary relations as role names. We'll probably mix those words. Speak about concepts and roles and relations. Uh, everything, yeah. Um, and now, well, the first thing, if you want to build an ontology in this logic ALC, the first thing that you need to know is how to build a concept, and then these concepts will put to, will be put together in the ontology. So an ALC concept is built according to this grammar rule here. Um, so we start from unary relation symbols or concept names, um, and then we have available the, the Boolean operators for some reason. Uh, in the description logic, they are written in this way and not in the more traditional way. I don't know why, frankly, but it's just the very same thing. And then you have some existential and universal quantification. Um, so don't be misled. Yeah, this is, we have a variable free syntax. This R here is not a variable, um, but it's a role name. It's a binary relation. Um, so this is an existential quantification over a binary relation and, and the universal one. I will give you the semantics on the next slide. Um, okay, and then an ontology is a finite set of inclusions or implications, you could also say, uh, between concepts. Um, every C must also be a D, that's what this says. And uh, well, I will, I will use this here, this equivalent symbol as an abbreviation for a mutual inclusion. So every C is also a D and vice versa. Okay, here's a short example still from the movie domain, yes, we could say in this language something like every movie is a comedy or a drama or a horror movie. Um, a director is defined as a person who has directed a movie or a TV series. And a foreign movie is defined as something that was only produced in countries which are not the US and that has at least one language which is not English. And this is actually the official definition from from the Academy Award. Um, yes, and then yeah, this, these things on the right are, are concepts, on the left also concepts. Um, you could also here have only atomic ones, only concept names. You could also use compound concepts there, of course. Okay, now what does this mean? Um, well, here's a, a, a quick uh, introduction of the semantics, but just by translating to standard first order logic. So concept names are unary relations. I already told you that. The Boolean operators are the Boolean operators, of course. And, and then this existential and universal quantification, that's the only thing that needs explanation, I suppose. So uh, if you're familiar with modal logic, then ALC is essentially modal logic. 
Um, the existential quantification would be a modal diamond and the universal one a modal box. But let's translate to first order logic. So exists RC, remember R is a binary relation, C is a concept. This says there exists some, so it, 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 it translates into a formula with one free variable. Every, sorry, I should have said that earlier. Every concept translates into a first order formula with one free variable, yes. And so this identifies the object X such that there's an R edge from X to Y and Y satisfies C. And dually this here says, it identifies the object X such that whenever I have an R edge to some Y, then that uh, Y is a C. And then the ontology is just translated uh, in an obvious way. So it's just implications between, between concepts. Um, so for example, just to show one example to make sure that we're on the same page here. Um, if we take this uh, statement from the previous slide, it would translate into this. It would just say uh, for all direct, so for all X, X is a director, even only if well, it's a person, and then there exists a Y such that Y was directed by X, and Y is a movie or a TV series. Um, yes. I mean, of course, I would like to get to the, the real materials of the tutorial, but if you don't understand my languages, then it will be difficult. So does it make you feel okay with what the ALT is, or one more? <laughs> Um, there are also many extensions. Uh, there's, there's one that I will use, but I think it's important to mention that there are many extensions of this language. Um, so this is what makes description logics a family of logics, a large family, because you can combine these extensions in various ways. And you can also restrict. Um, so uh, the first one, and this is one that I will use in this tutorial, is with inverse roles. So uh, you could now say something like this. Uh, every movie was directed by a director, and this thing here is not a typo, but this is exactly the new operator. This is the inverse role, this minus sign here. So you can use it in, in the two concept construct, the existential and the universal concept constructor. And the semantics is just that you speak about the binary relation uh, that you're using. Here it is directed, right? You speak about it in the opposite direction. So you said now, you, now you don't say I have an R successor that satisfies C, you say I have an, an R predecessor that satisfies C. This is, of course, a very natural thing to do, and this is why we we'll mostly use ALCI and not ALC. You can do more just to mention this. Um, uh, for example, number restrictions are another uh, a popular extension of, of ALC. Uh, so here you add uh, relatively simple forms of counting. Uh, you could say a multiplex is defined as a cinema that has at least two large screens. So you would now have such concept constructors where you not only speak about the existence of, uh, of um, R successes, but you speak about their number. Yeah, you have at least N R successes that satisfy C or at most. In modal logic, this would be called a graded modal logic. And uh, the semantics is again fairly, fairly obvious. This is the semantics for the at least operator. Yeah, this is an existential statement. You have at least N objects that are at our successes satisfy C and are pairwise distinct, of course. You could also add role inclusions, also something that is done very commonly. Um, now you have also inclusions between roles, between binary relations. You could say, well, directed by is a sub role of has on crew, things like this. And all these, or many of these, are included in well, all these and several more are included in the web ontology language L. Uh, but uh, I don't want to make it too complicated, and I will mostly concentrate, as I already said, on ALCI as the basic description logic. Okay, um, one or two more slides before I can actually uh, get on with something more interesting. Um, uh, let me also uh, give you the exact definition of what I mean by ontology-mediated querying. So. Uh, well, the answers to conjunctive queries on databases are, of course, or unions of conjunctive queries are, of course, defined in terms of homomorphisms as usual. After four days of this tutorial, I assume that at least four of you, you know, of course. Um, now, for an ontology mediated query and a database, so it consists again of these three components, yes, and we take a database D that is really formulated in the promised uh, schema sigma. Now we say that a tuple 
uh, of constants from the database is an answer if the following holds. If it is, if the tuple is an answer to the actual query in the ontology mediated query uh, on M, and this must hold for every database M that satisfies in the sense of extends the original database and also the ontology. And such an M I will call a model, yeah, a model of the, of the database and of the ontology. So if all models agree on the answer, then we accept the answer. This is of course just the standard certain answer semantics, which you might also have seen in other contexts in this, uh, in this summer school. Okay, and I will use various ways to write this. I think it will be clear. Let me point out the, at this point here, the, the difference to querying under constraints, of course, given by Andreas at the beginning of the week, yes, um, where there was also a logical theory that was put together with the data. Um, but uh, that's a slightly different setup, right? There, the data was promised to satisfy the statements in your logical theory. Um, here, this is not the case. Uh, we assume the data to be incomplete and the logical theory is used to extend the data, right? We're using models that start with the data, add something on top so that the ontology is satisfied. Okay, and uh, well, this is just my first example again. Um, uh, of the, obviously, this is what's going on here, what I just showed you. Yes, we, we start with a model of the database, well, we start with the database, um, and then the model, in the models, we can actually add something to our data to satisfy the ontology. Now the ontology is the same as before, but formulated in description logic. Um, and then we are interested in the certain answers. Every model must contain all this, and we get this. Okay, um, but this example is very simple, uh, or was very simple. So let me give you something more interesting. So here's an example supposed to show that sometimes more difficult things are going on. Um, you could uh, try to figure out what this ontology mediated query is actually asking. Um, so the ontology contains two statements here. It says, okay, either I have an X successor, which has a Y successor, which is P and a Y successor, which has an X successor and is P, then a zero is implied. And a zero is the concept name that I query uh, for in the end, yes. Or if I have an X successor, which has a Y successor not P, and a Y successor, which has an X successor not P, then also a zero. Now I query for a zero, and the data schema is restricted. The P is out, we take it out, yeah? it's not in the data schema. Only the roles X and Y are in the data schema. So the, the data is a, an edge labeled graph. Yeah? Uh, every edge is an X edge or a Y edge. And now we, we, we ask this slightly mysterious question here. Um, any hints as to or suggestions as to what this might, might ask for? It's not, not totally easy, I guess. You can also guess. Sorry? Uh, no, no, uh, that's not what it does. Um, it's not like uh, querying for emptiness. Um, it actually asks for uh, tri for no, not triangles, but these kind of grid cells in the data. So it would give you all the objects that are at the lower left corner of a grid cell. Why? I mean, there's no grid cell up here. Yes, there's no conjunctive query. Why would it do that? Yeah. Well. Um, you have to look at the P. The P is important. It could occur positively in the, in the first statement and negatively in the second statement, yes. So, uh, and we have to look at the, at the P in every possible model at the upper right point here. So this guy could satisfy P or not P, right? If it satisfies P, then this guy here has an X successor which has a Y successor in P and a Y successor which has an X successor in P. So a zero will be implied and this point will be returned. But if I make not P true here, then it will have an, well, it will be the same story, but now with a, with a not P. Yeah? And again, a zero will be true here. So in both cases, yeah, we, we get this. So it's a certain answer. On the other hand, um, if we don't have the triangle, let's say we have this, yes, 
then what we could do is we could at all x y successes we could make p true and at all y x successes we could make not p true um, and then of course none nothing in the ontology here tells us that a zero will be true at that point and this will not be enough mm -hmm. so um, this is querying for such squares uh, and uh, what's going on here? Yeah, it's slightly more confusing than the previous stuff. Um, well, intuitively, this P that we used here and that does not occur in the data, uh, it's a little bit like a, a unary second order variable, like a universally quantified unary second order variable that we use here in this example. And something like this will be going on implicitly and explicitly in uh, the remaining tutorial. Okay, let me uh, now uh, speak a little bit about data complexity. Um, so uh, for data complexity in our language, I'm going to look now at the ontology mediated querying language I denoted like this. Yeah? So with this, I mean the ontology mediated querying language where we use ALC ontologies and where we use atomic queries. Remember these very simple, super simple queries, A of X. Yeah? Um, and here, that's bad news, yes, OMQ uh, evaluation is OMP complete in data complexity. It's bad news for applications, it's good news for research, because this will be my starting point for trying to uh, uh, see what we can do about this. Yeah? Um, okay, so why is it OMP complete? That's really easy to see. Um, you can, for example, reduce non-three colorability. Um, so, of course, an undirected graph you can just view as a database uh, where you use a single binary relation as your schema. Um, and then three colorability can easily be expressed as an ALC ontology, or rather non-three colorability. What would you do? You would say, well, this is, this is logical truth, top is logical truth, yes. So um, everywhere, so every point uh, in my uh, graph is red or green or blue. Um, if uh, both, both endpoints of an R edge uh, are labeled red, yeah? so I am red and I have an R successor which is also red, then I signal a problem, read P as a, as, as, as a problem. Yeah? Same I do for green, same I do for blue. Um, and our query uh, as follows, is there a problem? Well, okay, actually I lied to you, it's a little bit of a different query here, it's, uh, it's an existentially quantified uh, atomic query. Um, and I think it should be clear that this expresses three colorability. Uh, the only thing that you might say is missing is I didn't, I didn't express that no point receives two colors. Yeah, I could express this. Uh, it turns out to not be necessary. Uh, the reduction works as stated, um, but as you su support this as well. Yeah, you could also write that. It would only make the slide a little bit more crowded. Yeah, so. However, I, in whichever way I color my graph with red or green or blue, I will always find a problem. You know, if this is the case, so if the query is uh, made true, then um, the graph is not three colorable. And then if it is three colorable, then I find a model that does not come with any problem and the query will not be in test. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yeah, this is what I just said. Okay, let's get back to, to these queries. Uh, maybe I cheated on you by using these Boolean ones. Yes, maybe uh, it's, it's uh, not that bad for the queries that we are really interested in. Yeah, but this is of course just a little bit of uh, manipulation of the, of the reduction. Yes, for example, what, there are different ways to do it. What you could do is you could introduce a fresh uh, constant, A0, which I call the spy point here. And I called it a spy point because A0 sees every node in the graph. So we introduce a fresh, Role name a fresh violation S and every uh, so this A0 just sees every graph node via S. And then you just say in your ontology, well, if I see an S point with a problem, then I have a problem myself. And now I don't need this uh, existential quantification anymore. Um, oops, actually I've, I didn't put a query here. I can just query now for yeah for, for P. So I can just so the question is just is P of A0 uh, true or not? And I get the same effect as before. Okay, 
And this here is basically folklore. I'm not even sure whether this is so explicitly written down. Scherf in 93 was the first to observe co-MP completeness, but he proved something much stronger than, than this. Okay, um, and this is in a sense the starting point for the first part of the tutorial. Um, the challenge is, well, ALC and ALCI and so on, these are languages that are used a lot for formulating ontologies because they've been standardized um, and because they seem to have a good expressive power for, for doing so. You will find on the web, you will find actually hundreds of ontologies that are formulated in uh, ALC and extensions. Um, but uh, if you want to put it to work with data, uh, then you run into this problem that co data complexity is, of course, too high, yes, for scalability. So, uh, as I said, for research, it's probably good. You can now ask many questions. For example, um, these ones here, I will not go through all of them in the tutorial, but uh, I will at least uh, look at two. So, first, are the concrete ontology-mediated queries used in the application really hard? Yeah, so three, maybe, maybe uh, the user does not want to uh, encode three colorability in his ontology. Actually, most likely he will not want to encode three colorability, but rather speak about something from his application domain. Yes, so maybe that's harmless then, uh, although the language in general is, is, is difficult. You could also ask, well, maybe you don't need exact answers. Yes, uh, with such high complexity, maybe approximation is a good idea. Um, you could also ask, is the full expressive power of this logic really needed? Or are your databases really as complicated as? you need for core and hardness because you also need different complicated databases and so on. And all of this has been asked in the area. Um, let me start with other concrete ontology mediated queries used in applications really hard. Um, so the idea here is that um, you start with some expressive ontology language that is intractable in general, ALCI. Yes, so many of your queries will not be good, like three colorability. But of course, you find areas of good behavior, like uh, concrete ontology-mediated queries might have polynomial time data complexity, um, or they might even be data log rewritable, which of course implies polynomial time data complexity, or rewritable into first order logic is even better, or satisfy some other conditions such as parallelizable. And with this rewritability things, what I mean is you take your entire ontology-mediated query, ontology plus query, yes, and then you try to rewrite it into an equivalent data log program or first order formula so that you only need to ask that second query to your, to your, over your data and you will get exactly the right answers. Yeah? And of course, this is good because if you are data log rewritable, you can use data log engines for, for querying. If you are first order writable, you can use SQL SQL databases for, for, for querying. Okay, and the, ideally, yeah, uh, let's be let's be bold. Ideally, one would hope to achieve complete classifications to understand this, the whole situation. Yes, so that if a user gives me some some concrete ontology-mediated queries that he or she wants to answer, um, uh, the red dots here, uh, then we can tell them, yeah, okay, this query you're lucky. Yeah, this is data log writable. This is even first order writable. For this one, well, I, I cannot do anything for you. This one is just a terrible query. Yeah? Maybe you have to rewrite your ontology a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, ideally, this would be very nice to have. And now when you try to, to, to answer this uh, question, to, to dig deeper, to, to, to understand this, um, uh, one will find uh, that there's a, a close connection to constraint satisfaction problems. And this is sort of the first topic first of the three that I would like to cover in my tutorial, um, this connection. Um, because I think it also tells you a lot about what these ontology-mediated queries really are, what is their expressive power. Um, yes. So let me just remind you what this constraint satisfaction problems. Uh, uh, they originally emerged in artificial intelligence, of course, and are now studied a lot also in uh, computational complexity theory. They can be viewed as generalized coloring problems. Yes, it's not only three colorability, it's more generalized. And uh, several equivalent definitions you can give of constraint satisfaction problems. And of course, for database people, the version uh, uh, in terms of homomorphisms is a very natural one. So I will here be interested in constraint satisfaction problems with a fixed template. 
Uh, and what's that? A template is just a finite relational structure T, a database, you could say. You know? um, and then the constraint satisfaction problem that is defined by this uh, template is the following. You're given a finite relational structure S, another database, and you want to know whether, or a query if you wish, and you want to know whether uh, there's a homomorphism from S to T. Yeah? So it's homomorphism problems into the fixed structure T. That's what the template gives you. There's an example, right? This template here uh, expresses three colorability. Um, and uh, well, here we are asking the question whether Australia is three colorable. Um, uh, it is, if you, if you wonder. Um, and if you have not seen, if you're familiar with CSPs, then this is the most trivial example, of course, that, that you can give. If you're not familiar with CSPs, then to understand it, it's important to, to note what is not there. And that is the reflexive loops. There's no reflexive loop at any of the nodes, yes? And this means that if I map an edge here on the left over to the right, yes, I must color the two endpoints differently. I cannot map it both Q and uh, Queensland and New South Wales. I cannot map this both to red, for example, because the, the, um, the reflexive edge is missing. And um, well, this, of course, is related to querying, yes? Every CSP template defines a Boolean query. Yes. So either so given a database, either I can map it homomorphically to the template, then it's a yes instance uh, or not. So it's a Boolean query. Now, what's the connection between uh, ontology-mediated queries and constraint satisfaction problems? So just as a reminder, atomic queries are these, and I will now also sometimes speak about these Boolean atomic queries, I had already used them in the three colorability example, yeah? So this is, uh, it's, it's a Boolean version of the, the atomic queries. And um, yes, so then this here is uh, a result that closely links ontology-mediated querying with the languages that we use here at least, Diego will use very different ones, um, to constraint satisfaction problems. Um, so it says that every ontology-mediated query from our language here, ALCI, and then these Boolean atomic queries here, is equivalent to the complement of a CSP and vice versa. Yeah? So very strong one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and well, if I, I mean, now you might say, okay, these Boolean atomic queries are a bit contrived, yes. Maybe at the least thing we want is this uh, atomic queries here. Um, well, let's do it. Yes, the, the, the connection still holds. It only becomes a little bit more ugly. Um, so ALCI with atomic queries, uh, every query from this here is equivalent to the complement of a CSP that now has more than one template, multi-template CSP. And it also has a single constant. Um, normally CSPs don't have constants here, we need one. Um, and, and vice versa. And why do I think this is an interesting result? Well, um, actually, when you try to implement this program that I had uh, laid out before to really classify the computational behavior and rewritability of your ontology-mediated queries, then this here is a little bit like a breakthrough to, to a completely different land. Um, and it's quite a, quite a rich and, and beautiful land that, that you're breaking through. Um, because in the area of constraint satisfaction problems, there has been a lot of work, uh, many years of work, on exactly the questions that I had asked for ontology-mediated queries before. Yeah. Um, with multiple like CSP, do you mean that... Um, yes, I wasn't very... The precise. question is that you have an homomorphism in one of the templates or in all of them? In one is enough, yes. Mm -hmm. I'll give a brief intuition later why this comes up. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yes, <laughs> sorry, it's difficult to see who's speaking. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a good question, and this is on, on the bottom of this slide. So. <laughs> I will not answer. Um, oh, no, it's at the top of the slide. Right, I changed the order. <laughs> um, yes, so of course, uh, the recent result 
uh, sort of reason from CSPs is the one you just mentioned, yeah, from from Bulatov and Juk, um, uh, that the 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 borderline between polynomial time and uh, and the complete constraint satisfaction problems is completely uh, classified and understood. Uh, and in particular, there is a dichotomy. There's no NP intermediate problems there. Every CSP is either NP time or NP complete. And it comes with, with an algebraic condition that clearly maps out the, um, the, the, the frontier. Does this correspond to an, uh, to a, this is how I understood your question, yes? I mean, yes, we can take it back to the ontology mediated querying side. Um, so this puts us into the position that for every ontology mediated query, we can, in principle, determine whether it's NP time or NP hard. Uh, by hand, I, the decidability is open of this condition, even for CSP, yes. Um, for, for, but um, it's not a very, I mean, well, it's not easy, yeah. We will see how to translate in a second between uh, OMQs and CSPs. I wanted to show this. I already realized that I was a bit ambitious, so already 45 minutes, um, but see, let's see. Um, but it's, it's not so easy to, uh, I mean, even for CSPs, it's not formulated in this homomorphism formulation, right? It's an algebraic condition. Um, and uh, well, there's another level of translation and change in perspective when you go to ontology mediated queries. Okay, that's one thing. There's more, yeah? There's uh, data lock rewritability um, of uh, co-CSPs in, uh, uh, in this case is decidable and NP-complete, realized by Bartle and Kojic. Um, Kosi, so what you do is you, uh, you express in data log the case that there's no homomorphism into the template. Yeah, this is why I speak of co-CSP here. Yeah? Um, and also, uh, well, first order writability of co-CSPs is also decidable and NP-complete. And all these results lift to this case that I had mentioned before, multi-template CSPs with a single constant. Um, so uh, yeah, this is what I meant with the rich land because these results are all uh, completely non-trivial. Um, the most approachable one is, is this here, uh, the first order of writability. Okay, um, let's, let's see how we can translate ontology mediated queries to CSPs and, and vice versa. So um, let's first go from CSPs, a complement to ontology mediated queries. That's simple. Um, you have already seen it, yes? So we have already expressed uh, three colorability uh, as an ontology mediated query. And uh, well, that was the template for three colorability, right? So this template, we know already how to translate. Um, in general, of course, templates can be much more complicated, you know? Um, but it doesn't matter. They are just translated in exactly the same way. So what would you say? Well, the, 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 this is a complicated template, but it has a finite number of nodes, of course. So basically here I've determined the colors and now here it's like the, the homomorphism targets. So every constant in my database must be homomorphically mapped to some element of my template, right? And I need to know to which one. So uh, I just guess, you know, either it's mapped to the first node of the complicated template or second or and so on. You know? <coughs> And then of course, I must ensure that uh, the mapping that I've guessed here is really a homomorphism. So if we assume that we have only a single binary relation R, which is not important, but let's assume it for simplicity, yes, then we must uh, make sure that um, uh, if there's an R edge in the data, there's also one in the template uh, at the point that we map to. So if we decide to map a node to VI, and an R successor of the node to VJ, but there is no edge in the template between VI and VJ, yes, then we should again signal the problem. It's the same like with coloring uh, uh, my graph with red and green and blue. And then I query for a problem, and the logic is just exactly the same. So every, every CSP over binary relations, yes, we cannot expect <laughs> to translate hierarchy relations, uh, every CSP on binary and unary relations can be easily actually expressed as an ontology mediated query. Okay, what about the other direction? Uh, that's a bit more interesting. So, um, 
let's take an ontology mediated query from our language. So ontology is formulated in ELC, ALCI, sorry. And here uh, we will need uh, uh, types. Um, types are used a lot in, in description logics. What I mean is just essentially just the standard notion of types that you might know from first order logic. Here they are a little bit simpler because our logics are simpler, but they are in essence the very same thing. So um, what is a type? Well, first let me, with sub of O, let me denote the set of subconcepts of the ontology. So in this example, for example, sub of O would be this set. Yeah, you just collect all the concepts that occur in the ontology and you close up off on the sub expressions. And then what's a type? Um, well, a type of a constant in some model of the ontology is uh, well, denoted like this, and it's simply the set of subconcepts of the ontology that the model makes true at the point that we have selected. You know? So a type describes a single element or constant in a model of the ontology, simply the set of concepts that this makes true. Yeah, remember that description logic concepts correspond to first order formulas in one free variable. So we just collect those formulas that are true at that point. <clears throat> okay, and then here's one notation. Yes, um, a sort of a compatibility notation. Let's say we have two types T, T prime. Again, they describe two points in the model. Yes, and then we uh, write this here where R is the role name. Um, if, well, whenever for all our C is in T, then C is in T prime. And conversely, if for all our minus C is in T prime, then C is in T. So what does this mean? It means uh, we can put an R edge, we are allowed to put an R edge between two elements, one of type T and one of type T prime. This will not result in a conflict. We don't have to put the edge, but we could. So that's what this says. Okay, and now here's the, um, here's the template. Um, The domain consists of the types uh, that are realizable in some model of the ontology that makes the query false. Yeah? So you now use types as elements of the template. And then the unary facts in the template, they are easily determined. You just look into your types. Yes, you just say, okay, type T makes B true if and only if it contains B. The binary relations, you interpret, uh, interpret them maximally. So in your templates, you put a lot of binary relations. Whenever you're allowed to put a binary relation between two types, then you will put it. Okay. So this is an example. Um, very simple ontology, simple query. This is the template that would uh, emerge from it. Um, uh, you can just take it as an artist's impression if you want. Um, <laughs> but, um, well, one can see some things there. It's a slightly, slightly unusual representation of a logical series. Yeah? But um, what does it, what can you do? I mean, so for example, if you look at, at this part of the template, yes, it means, okay, whenever I decide to put for all RA to make it true somewhere in my, uh, in my database, yes, because the database might map a point homomorphically to this point, yes. Then, well, if I, if I have an R successor in the database, there I must make A true, and I must also make for all R A true. So these kind of dependencies, basically, are expressed in uh, such a template. Okay, and... Um, okay, we'll try to prove it. <laughs> Let's, let's, let's prove it, otherwise it's maybe <laughs> too abstract. I'm hesitating a bit between jumping over it for the sake of time. Okay, let's see. Um, let, let's prove it to get, uh, get, get a better impression of what's going on here. So um, we need to prove two things, two directions, right? First, let's say the database makes the query false. This implies that there is a homomorphism from the database to the template. So database makes the query false. Um, this means um, that there is a model M of the database and the ontology that does make the query false, yes? 
If the query is false, then you have a witness model for that. You have a counter model. Okay, and now from that counter model, we will just read off the homomorphism to the template that we need. Yes, because in that counter model, at every constant, some type is realized, and the elements of the template are types. So I just look into the counter model, which type is made true there, and this is how I define my homomorphism. And then it's actually easy to see that this is a homomorphism uh, to the template. For the other direction, um, if there is a homomorphism, then the query is made false. Well, take a concrete homomorphism H from the database to the template. Now, what does, give, does this give us? It gives us a type for every point in the database that we want to make true there. We have to do this. We construct a model for the database and the ontology by just starting with the database, okay? And then realizing the type prescribed by the homomorphism target at each point in the database. And we do this by plugging in tree-shaped models. So we start with the database, and then we want to realize exactly the right type. Um, the template construction makes sure that there is no problem in the database. So if we have an R edge between two different objects here, there will not be a problem. The only thing that might be, a little, might be problematic is we might have an existential quantification, an existential demand in the type. The type may say, OK, I want to have some R neighbor that satisfies something. And this may not be in the database. And we fix this by plugging in uh, models. Tree-shaped models are enough in ALC um, to actually satisfy also those existential demands. Yes? Um, a question about the, the construction of the template. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, somehow uh, populate the domain uh, without testing for the types to be reliable? Like, is it sufficient to just take the one that is actually dropping to the zero? Um, it, um, yes, yes, you, uh, you can do this, yeah. Um, I mean, you could, I define types semantically here. An alternative is to define them syntactically. And uh, then what you what you say is just exactly the, the right thing. You would you would include all syntactically defined types that do not contain a zero. Yeah, um, I mean, in, in any case, uh, of course, this is exponential. There are exponentially many types. Yes, and so even if you want to define it uh, semantically and then do a satisfiability check, somehow it will it will not really make the complexity worse. Yes, it's just it's just a blow up that occurs. That. So, okay, here's one slide of reflection. Um, yes, um, so why did this work? You know, what, uh, what is the properties of, of, of ALC that made this work? Will this work for every ontology language? Is this coincidence? What's going on somehow? Just a bit of explanation, trying to, yes. Uh, from my perspective, uh, this equivalence holds because ALCI is emphasizing so much unary relations and formulas with, with one free variable over binary relations. Yes, We use one types here, types that represent single objects. In first order logic, you would also have like two types, at least two, also three types, four types maybe, <laughs> but at least two types if you have binary relations. And we didn't use such things here. So uh, there's a strong, in the, in the languages that we use, which are again a form of modal logic, there's a strong emphasis on, on one free variable, yes, and unary relations. And this is essential for the CSP connection because homomorphisms map single objects to uh, objects in the template. That's exactly what we exploit. And also the queries being of a simple form helps. Um, I did it for these simple things here. It extends to unary tree conjunctive queries. Um, not much further, as we will see. Well, not in this form. OK, so why did I speak about multi-templates with a single constant? That was, uh, I promised to also get back to this, what is going on there. So if we go from the Boolean version of, the, of our queries to this, back to this unary version here, well, intuitively, we now need a distinguished element in the template. That's the element where that, that actually corresponds to the, to the 
answer that we want to want to give. Yes, it's not just true or false anymore. It's like we want to give return database constants as answers now, and this forces us to identify a point in the template uh, which corresponds to the answer, and this we formalize by by a constant c. And now we should not avoid a everywhere. That's what you suggested. Yes, uh, just avoid it everywhere. And that works in the Boolean case. Now it doesn't work anymore because we can make a true somewhere in the template as long as we make it false at this point that corresponds to the point where we return the answer. And why do we get multiple templates then? Well, because we could put, for, we will actually use the same template, the one that I've shown you, the same template multiple times. Only the constant will be put into different points. Yes, sometimes all the points that make all a false are candidates for getting the constant. That's what we do. Okay, and now um, you can lift. Okay, so I have to quite a little make much sense. Uh, now you can lift this results through the construction to ontology mediated queries. So the template construction incurs an exponential blow up that is unavoidable. Um, and um, first order, well, this means that you only get naively a next time upper bound, uh, which is high complexity, of course, but at least it's decidable. These are very complicated problems. It's good that they are decidable, yes. Um, and it turns out that this is actually uh, complete. So um, the, 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 the blow up, the increase in the complexity that you get through the blow up, this is real. You cannot do uh, somehow a better uh, construction and get rid of it. Um, the problems are complete. And we get, get uh, quite a bit more out of this. It's not only complexity results, we also get algorithms with which you can construct the first order rewriting. Those turn out to always be UCQs, even always UCQs that are tree shaped. Okay, and now I'm an hour into my tutorial, and um, it's a bit problematic. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, I will do the following. Um, I will just mention that, no, this I will not do at all. Oh, oh very slow, my keynote. Uh, sorry. Yes, I will only mention that if you are interested in conjunctive queries, which is what we are interested in, um, then actually the CSP connection in this form breaks. Um, that, that, so these are more expressive than constraint satisfaction problems, these languages here, but there's still something on the CSP side that helps you. And this is uh, a generalization, a logical generalization of CSP, which you might or might not have heard of, which is called uh, MMSNP. So my very short message here is even with conjunctive queries, you can exploit the CSP connection, although it doesn't exactly go to CSPs anymore. Yes, uh, but there are results for that uh, as well. Well, uh, a little bit less, but by now this is also quite well developed. Uh, to, um, to, to get results on the complexity and rewritability also for such languages. Good. Now I will jump a bit. Let me make uh, somehow. <laughs> Sorry. I really have to think about which parts to include. It's not I'm sorry for the mess. <laughs> um, hmm. I guess I will just do this. Yes. Okay. So here comes something more lighter. I mean, the, the CSP connection was was. Uh, this is, in a sense, heavy stuff, especially the results in CSP are, of course, quite deep. Um, let me now make a small digression and go to a simpler language. Um, in a sense, I'm in this tutorial not so interested in this language per se, but I will use it later. I want to approximate my queries now. Yeah? I will go to a second way of addressing this co-NP difficulty. Um, 
uh, by approximation. And for approximating, I will use simpler ontology languages, and ELI is one of them. So ELI is a fragment of uh, ALCI. It basically drops uh, uh, disjunction and negation and also universal quantification. I didn't put this here, actually. So uh, the concepts that we can formulate in ELI look like this. We have conjunction, we have still our existential quantification. We have it also backwards. And logical. this is just logical truth, this we also have available. OK, and the intuition is that uh, actually these describe trees, yes? So an ELI EL concept, you can view it like a tree. So A and exists RB basically can be viewed as this tree. And exists RA and exists S minus B, that would be like this tree. Um, so uh, in, in ALC, we have seen one can do non-tree-like things, like this, this square that I had shown you. It's not the case in, in, in ELI. Um, and you could view it as a simple form of tuple generating dependencies. Um, this might seem like a very weak language, and it is. Um, uh, yet it is actually quite popular for, for ontologies. Um, it's also standardized as the so-called profile. Fragment would maybe be the better name in the OWL language. And uh, it is very popular in particular for medical and bio uh, ontologies. So this here is an excerpt of the SNOMED CT ontology that speaks about inflammations and the, uh, of the heart. Um, and uh, this is formulated in EL. Not only this fragment, the entire ontology is actually formulated in EL. Um, yes. <laughs> I don't know what I should show you. Um, now, ELI concepts uh, are also the same, of course, as unary tree CQs. Yes, I mean, I already told you, you can view them as trees. Uh, and and uh, these trees, you can uh, they, they, they still have one free variable, yes, and you can conveniently write them, therefore, as a unary tree CQ. Yeah, so this here would be the CQ with free variable X. This corresponds to this ELI concept here. And then an ELI concept is made true at database A if and only if there's a homomorphism from this uh, tree query uh, to the database that maps the answer variable to A. So the only thing that I mean to say here is ELI concepts, tree-shaped databases, unary tree CQs, this is pretty much all the same. And I'm speaking a lot about trees in this part of the uh, tutorial. Now, um, an important a uh, tool for ELI is the chase. Um, have you seen the chase already three times in previous tutorials? Cool. Um, I, I'm happy to hear that uh, because then I can just tell you that in ELI, uh, you can just use the chase in the way in which you've probably seen it. Not very important. There are several versions of the chase. Not very important for what I'm doing here, which version you actually use. Think of the restricted chase, if you know what that is. Um, so, yeah, if you have a, have a database and you have an ELI ontology, you can essentially chase in the expected way by just using the expressions in the ontology as rules, yeah. Um, so, uh, what does this ontology say? It says A implies exists as A, so you would here add an S successor, you would go on forever, you would then wire this inclusion here, transport the A to there, go on takes like a second for each animation to appear, and so on. You know? So with this, you're familiar, right? This should be clear, I hope. Good. Um, and the chase, of course, this you two should then maybe also know, the chase uh, builds a uh, universal model. Um, yes. So if you take an ELI ontology and a database, and the chase of the database with the ontology is universal for conjunctive uh, queries in the sense that that well model, and then second, for every conjunctive query Q, the answers to Q on the chase without any ontology involved, yes, are the same as the answers to Q on the database taken together with the ontology. So these are the answers that we are really interested in, but the answers to the query on the chase are just exactly the same. Uh, here for this simple language. And now the chase is, of course, infinite. 
but it has a rather restricted shape. Yes, you have the data picture already occurred in a different context. Yeah, you have the data, and then uh, you have like you create like infinite trees below every data object. This is what the chase gives you if you chase with an ELI ontology. It's real trees, yeah, in ELI. Okay. And um, well, uh, what this gives you is essentially p time data complexity. Um, of course, not immediately. You know, the chase is infinite. So uh, ideally, you would just like to compute the chase um, and then um, uh, uh, evaluate the query on it. Um, somehow, you have to tame uh, the infinity of the chase to get a real decision procedure. And uh, there are several ways to do it. I will speak a little bit more about it later. I don't want to go into detail now. Um, for example, you could exploit the fact that the trees that you have added have a very regular structure. They are infinite, yes, but they are very regular because you have constructed them according to the rules in the ontology. So there is a way to tame the infinite chase, but then because you can evaluate on this one model, on this universal model, you get, of course, for this logic here, you get p-time data complexity. So co and p for ALC, that was bad. Um, now we dropped negation, disjunction, and so on. And we got down to p-time data complexity for ELI. Um, this, I will, this is what I will do later. Yes, so here I don't want to go into much. I am just saying there are, there are several ways in which you can deal with the infiniteness of the, of the, of the chase, yes. No. No, at this point, you just have to believe me that um, uh, I will come back to it. <laughs> yes, this is how I meant it to be. <laughs> the only thing that I wanted to make, uh, that I wanted to point out here is there is this simpler fragment. It has p-time data complexity because I now want to use it for approximating the, the more complicated logic. Yes, um, And the p-time data complexity is essentially due to the chase. Yes, the infiniteness you have to deal with, but the, the real virtue is it's one model. Yes? In the case of ALC, where you have disjunctions, you have, of course, no universal models. You always need to look at many, many models, like the possible three colorings of your graph and stuff like this. Here, you have just one model. And in my thinking, this is the reason for P-time. And the infiniteness, you know, that's secondary somehow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, so this is where I wanted to get with, uh, uh, with the ELI, um, the second part of my tutorial, um, uh, and maybe the last I'm boring, <laughs> but okay, and that's the way it is. <laughs> and I would like to take a look at approximation, and um, here I don't want to hurry. Um, so let's just do this and see uh, what the time says after it. Um, yes. So it's still about co and p completeness of my original language, ALC, with whatever kind of queries you want to use. And uh, now I want to, uh, yes, tame this by having polynomial time data complexity approximation. And how can this be done? Well, there are two ways to approximate in general, right? You could approximate from below, meaning that uh, your answers are sound, but potentially incomplete, yeah? So every answer that you will get by the approximation is really an answer, um, but you might miss some answers. You could also approximate from above. That will be complete, but potentially unsound. So here you are guaranteed to get all answers, but you also get junk. You know? This is a bit more worrying, of course, but in principle, you can do both, especially uh, if in practice you do both in parallel, and you happen to get the same answers for both kinds of approximations, yes, then you know that uh, you have actually found the exact answers. They're sound and complete. Okay. And this is actually used successfully in practice. Uh, for example, there's a system called Pagoda that's probably the most advanced one from Oxford. There are also other systems. Uh, and actually, in practice, it seems that this happens often, that the, the two kinds of approximations coincide, and in this way, you really get the answers. Now, the practical systems, they approximate like in a very ad hoc way. Uh, they would just say things like, okay, if I have a disjunction, I just drop the subconcept. 
Um, or I replace, if I want to approximate from below, yeah, I would just drop it. If I approximate from above, I maybe replace it with a conjunction, but really very, very ad hoc. Um, and here I would like to try to do something more, uh, more principled, yes? So again, ontology-mediated querying is this question that I put here in this box. Yeah. Um, and well, which points of attacks do we, do we have for approximation? If we want to approximate from below, and this is what I will concentrate on uh, at the beginning, is then, uh, well, we want to relax something. Something needs to be relaxed, yes, to, to get better data complexity. What can we relax? Well, there are three components here, the database, the ontology, and the query. Is it uh, a good idea to relax the query? Well, not really, right? Because we have seen that already these very, very simple queries give co MP hardness, so there isn't much to relax there. We can relax the ontology. Um, yes, and this is what I'm going to do. And actually, uh, we can relax it into uh, ELI. We have just seen ELI is better behaved than ALC, so maybe do that. Yes. Or we can relax the database as well. And I will also briefly mention that, yes. So, for example, uh, you can relax it by a database of bounded tree width, because on bounded tree width you have p-ton query evaluation, even with an ontology. Okay, that was just the intro. Let me make it precise. Um, so I will now look at approximations from below, and what I'm relaxing for the time being is the ontology. Right? Take that. So what one should start with is choosing an approximation ontology language L. So this should be an ontology language L, such that the data complexity gets down to p time, of course. And we have just seen one, this is ELI. Uh, there are other options as well. You could use TGDs, um, suitably restricted, yeah, guarded, frontier one, and so on. We will also use do that, yeah, because different kind of approximation. So let me define what my approximations actually are. An L ontology relaxing, so L is a chosen language, yeah, ontology relaxing approximation of my ontology mediated query. Uh, the set of answers is defined as follows. What I do is I take every ontology O prime formulated in the weaker language L that is logically implied by the original ontology O. Yeah? This is what I mean by relaxing the ontology. Um, and uh, then I compute the answers uh, to this uh, implied ontology O prime uh, on the database, and the query just stays the same, database as well, yes, and uh, then we, uh, the which is in Python, and then we take the uh, union of all answers. Now, this is of course not algorithmically possible, what I just said, yes, it only defines the semantics here, it's only there to tell you what the approximate answers that I would like to compute are, because this arguably is a nice and principled definition of approximation, yes. Um, of course, you cannot just implement it right away because there are infinitely many of this uh, L ontologies O prime uh, that are implied by your uh, original ontology. So we don't want to compute all these O prime thingies, or in other words, all this ontology mediated queries Q prime. We cannot, there are too many of them, yes. We only want to compute these answers without ever computing the, the O prime or the Q prime. Okay, and there are now some steps involved in achieving something like this. So the first step is to go from these infinitely many implied ontologies to one single ELI ontology, one single approximation ontology. That is infinite. It seems we haven't gained much there, yes. And indeed, we will need more steps. It doesn't solve the whole problem, yes. But this is the first thing that we do. So uh, we take an ontology-mediated query in our expressive language, ALC, ALCI, and we take an approximation language, and now we say, okay, um, this ontology, the approximation ontology in L, is just a set of all concept inclusions. I know we'll go zoom in a little bit, a set of all concept inclusions, um, such that, of course, in the weaker language, such that the original ontology implies all these, uh, implies the concept. And there are infinitely many, and then I take this as an ontology-mediated query. Why is this okay? Well, it's easy to see, actually. So okay, meaning that the answers don't change when going from the infinitely many ontologies to the one infinite ontology. 
Well, the inclusion from left to right is actually immediate since um, O prime, every O prime is contained in my infinite ontologies, yes. And therefore, whatever I get here, yeah, this is only logically stronger on the right side. Whatever I get here, I must also get there. That's kind of clear. Um, for the other direction, if we get an answer out of this infinite ontology here, yeah, so the data together with the infinite ontology gives me an answer, then I can apply compactness because this all actually falls within first order logic. And uh, this then gives me, well, a finite subset of my infinite ontology that also gives the same answer. And well, that's one of the approximation ontologies that I had originally. Yeah? So it's only compactness that you need essentially for this here to hold. Okay, and from now on, I will concentrate on ELI as my approximation language. Let me give you some examples of what's actually going on here. So uh, first, uh, about infinity, that you can really get infinitely many consequences in this in the weaker language that you cannot finitely represent. Yeah. So um, let's use this ALC ontology O here. Um, I will guide you through it. Don't read it now. Uh, and let's leave, use these ELI consequences. So let's start here. Yeah. So let's look at the left side of this implication here. What does it say? It tells me, okay. I have an R successor which satisfies A, and then I have a path of N uh, S successors. Okay, and now uh, we should look at the ontology. What does the ontology tell me? It tells me if I'm an A, then I'm B1 or B2. Okay, first case is I'm B1. Yeah? If I'm B1, then I satisfy the right-hand side of this inclusion. Because, well, what does it say? It says I have an R successor, which is B1. Yes, check. And I have an S path of length N. Yeah. Second case is I satisfy B2. Then the ontology tells me, okay, it says something about exists RB2. So I position myself here. I now have an R successor in B2. And then the ontology tells me, okay, then you must also have an R successor in B1 and L. Moreover, if you are L, you will just C else forever along an S path. And again, I've satisfied the right hand side. Again, I have an R successor in B1, which is now the right one, and an S path of length n, even a longer S path. Okay. What's the point here? The point is that this is all implied by this ontology for every n. And of course, there are infinitely many choices for n. And um, it really is counting over n. Yes, you cannot replace this n here with going on forever because the first choice prevents it from, from doing. Yes, um, you need to look at all. So if you approximate this ALC ontology here in ELI, you need to look at really all possible finite depths. This just happens to be a consequence in this language of that ontology. And there is no way to represent this finitely. You can prove this. I don't want to do it. Uh, another example showing another effect uh, of what's going on here. So um, a very simple ALC ontology. The point here is that you sometimes have to introduce fresh symbols into your ontology to be complete. This is again a very simple ontology. And here is again an ELI consequence. And let me tell you what this is. So. Again, let's look again. Uh, let's look first at the left hand side. Left hand side look, looks like this. I have an R successor in B1 and an A, and I have an R successor in B2 and an A. Yes, and A, right? A is a symbol that does not occur at all in the ontology. But the ontology tells me, well, there's a disjunction again. It tells me either the all my R successors in B1 are a B, so this guy is a B, or all R successors in B2 are a B, so that guy is a B. Yeah. Now, in both cases, this tessor, that is both A and B. And well, so in the approximation of the, of the ontology, we find this, yeah? we find this inclusion. So if I have an R successor in B1 and A, and I have one in B2 and A, then, well, I must have an R successor in A and B. 
And the point again here is there is a symbol, A, that didn't occur in the original ontology. No, you need to put it into your approximation ontology because you could query for it. Your query could just be, please give me all points that have an R successor in A and B, and you will miss something if you don't include this. Fortunately, it suffices to include all symbols from the query. So if you take all symbols that occur in the query, you add them on top of your ontology, then that's all you need. You don't need to invent additional uh, symbols. Yes. Um, no. <laughs> uh, um, actually, uh, ELI does not have interpolation. So um, I'm not sure, frankly. I, have to, I would have to think about it. ALC has interpolation, so maybe it's because of that. <laughs> I, I don't have a good answer. I, I have to think. <laughs> um, okay. So that was just some examples showing that there are actually weird effects if you start doing this. Approximating one logic in another logic, that's a complicated business, yes? Um, fortunately, we're in the end only interested in querying, and this is what helps us out. Um, so let's go one step further before the break towards um, uh, computing the approximate answer. The first step that we had already done was going from infinitely many finite ontologies to one infinite ontology. Um, now we do the next step. Um, and this is related to the unraveling of databases into uh, tree or forest-like databases. Um, I hope this is something that is not uh, so unusual for, for you. Um, so uh, this is uh, just a definition by example. Yes, this is my original database. And then I construct the unraveling as follows. I start at every point here, A and B. And then I just look, OK, what edges do I have at A, both outgoing and incoming? Outgoing edges here are R and S, so I put one R successor and one S successor, which intuitively are copies of B. I have an incoming T edge, so I could put a T predecessor, which is also a copy of B, of course. And then I, I proceed, yes, this is a copy of B, so I already have an incoming R edge, I put an incoming S edge, an outgoing T edge, and I just continue going forever. Yeah. So I, I really take my database apart a lot. Yeah, it looks very different, of course. Um, but uh, in this weak language, in the language in which I'm approximating, um, we cannot tell the difference, at least not if the queries themselves cannot tell the difference. So let's say we look at tree-shaped conjunctive queries, and of course at ELI, and then, well, it ha just happens to be the case that the answers uh, to uh, uh, your query, which is now formulated in ELI, it's not approximation here, yes, with a tree-shaped conjunctive query on the database, it's just the same as the answer to your query on the unraveling. And the reason is, uh, I don't want to prove it, the formal proof uses simulations, uh, everything is trees. Yeah? That's what I had tried to illustrate before. The concepts in your ontology are trees, uh, both on the left side of your implication and on the right side of your implication. The queries are trees. And if everything is trees, you cannot really distinguish between the database and the tree unraveling of the database. Yeah. And that's not true in ALC, of course. Yeah? Uh, remember the grid self from my first example. Okay, and this is probably uh, the last slide then before the break, but it's an important one. So here we make the next step, and uh, actually uh, a very important step for approximating. So what does this say? It says, okay, we start with <coughs> in the language that we want to approximate, the expressive language, ALCI. And for simplicity, we take tree CQs. We will rectify this later, but let's now take tree CQs. Um, okay, and we also take a database B. Then uh, the approximate answers, this is now with the single infinite ontology, doesn't matter, right? So the approximate answers on the original database, they're just the same as the answers to the original query in the expressive language on the tree unraveled database. Uh, we are still in an infinite setup. The tree unraveling is also infinite. <laughs> we're still not there. We uh, don't have an algorithm yet, but we're, we're 
approaching. So why is this the case? Well, let's just go through it. It's not very difficult, yes. So uh, if you have an answer according to this approximate query on the original database, um, then by this um, uh, lemma that I'd shown you on the previous slide, that this language cannot distinguish between databases and tree unravelings, of course, this is this, you also get that this is an answer for the approximate query on the unraveled data. Um, and this, of course, implies that this is also an answer to your original query on the unraveled database because your original query is just stronger than the approximate query. Okay, in the other direction, if you have an answer to the query on the unraveled database, well, then this implies that this is also an answer to your original query on some finite uh, fragment of the unraveled database just by compactness again. Yeah, and we can assume that uh, this fragment is an initial piece of the infinite tree that is rooted at the answer that you get. Yeah? So it's a finite tree, F is a finite tree. If you get an answer to the original query on the unraveled database, then already a finite tree, finite subtree will give you the answer. Oh, it's a finite tree, so we can represent it as an ELI concept, let's call it CF. Yes, and this ELI concept will then be true at the point that we got as an answer. Okay. Now the tree CQ, remember we are answering tree CQs here, can also be represented as an ELI concept. Yeah, everything is trees, CQ. And uh, well, um, now because A is in Q of F. Um, the approximate ontology contains this implication here, yes? If I see the F tree, that is the tree which gave me the actual answer, well, then I get an answer, then the query is true. Yeah? So the finite part of the database, that this implies the query because it's all trees, it will actually be, I will actually find it in my, uh, in my approximated ontology. Okay. And now the last step is that, okay, the approximated ontology made the tree true at the point that I'm interested in. So of course, no, not ontology, I'm sorry. The approximated database, the unraveled database made uh, the tree true at the point A where that I'm interested in. So of course the original database also makes the tree true. Yeah, unravel, this is only stronger than it's unraveling. Well, and now I know what? I know the tree is true at A in the original database. This implies the query, so I get uh, that um, uh, on the, uh, the original database together with the approximated ontology gives me a query. Time is over. Uh, let me just summarize again. Yes, we went from an approximate query basically to an approximate database, and we now have to see, but that's easy, how to deal with the fact that this database is infinite. Yeah, we don't. We don't. We don't have it in our hands. In our hands, we have this database. Uh, so we need some more trick, small tricks to do this. Uh, and then this will be done. Okay, and now have a good coffee break. Welcome to the second part of the tutorial. Um, maybe let me briefly recap where we stopped. Um, we were looking at this uh, expressive ontology language, ALCI. We are currently approximating in this weaker one ELI, no disjunction, no negation, and we're restricting our view on uh, tree conjunctive queries. And what we have figured out until now is actually uh, we can completely, the approximation language, we can completely get it out of the picture because um, for getting the answers that we really want, uh, which I think we're quite well motivated, yes, it suffices to evaluate the original query in the expressive language on the unraveled database. That's exactly what I just said. And we're only given, uh, of course, uh, the original database. Yes, <laughs> the unraveling is infinite and we don't have it in our hands. Okay, but this is now something that we can handle. Um, we can handle with the direct algorithm. 
Uh, so if we are given an ontology-mediated query in the expressive language based on trees, tree CQs, and a database, um, and a candidate answer, then we can decide within this time here whether uh, the candidate really is an answer, meaning whether it is an answer to the original query on the unraveled database. And uh, this is, of course, uh, probably the best time you can hope for with such an approximation. Yes, It's linear in the database. Um, it's a fixed parameter linear, you could say. Um, it's only single exponential in the size of the original query. That's clear. I mean, the uh, reasoning with this expressive language is, is never any better than x times. But it's separated from the data. OK, um, so how, we do, how do we do that? Uh, well, the very first thing is uh, just a small thing. It's uh, instead of tree CQs, we can as well consider on these atomic queries, again, these very simple ones, because the tree CQs, we can push them into the ontology. We can just, uh, I mean, uh, this we can express actually as an ELI concept. If it's a tree shaped CQ, therefore it's an ALCI concept. And then we can just write, okay, the query implies A0, where A0 is a fresh concept name, and then we query for the fresh concept name. So atomic queries are enough. If we can do it for atomic queries, we have shown it also for tree CQs. Um, and how do we do it? Well, types play an important role again. Um, we use an algorithm that uh, is of the type elimination kind. So type elimination is an approach that is used very often for many different reasoning services in uh, description logic. Um, so uh, what would you do here? Well, uh, basically, you want to figure out uh, which types are realizable at which point in your database? Well, not quite. Um, in the unravel database, right? You have the original database and you have the constants in there. And then you have the unravel database. And there, basically, you have copies of the constants of your original database. And now you want to figure out which types can be realized at those copies. And um, you start with considering every type possible. So what you do is you work with the real database, of course. Yeah? Um, and then for every constant in it, uh, let, you let, uh, well, TA be the set of all types T that could possibly be realized at A. So what does it mean? You only look at the concept names. Well, if our database tells me that this object small a is a, is a B, then B must be in the type. Yeah, otherwise the type is out. Yeah? Um, but those types I all put there. I label my A with all these types. And then comes the elimination phase, where repeatedly we drop types uh, that uh, actually cannot really be realized uh, at those points. Um, so what do we do? Consider a type that is still that we still consider possible for the constant a, and then we look at all, well, let's say outgoing edges first from a to b in the database, the original database. Yes. Um, uh, and we look uh, such that, well, uh, for all types that we still consider possible for B, we have that they are not compatible with an RH. Yes, we have a type, we have chosen our type at A, and for all types of B, it holds that, well, they are not really compatible with this fact here. Yeah? Uh, this was defined before, right? The universal restrictions are sort of violated. Um, okay, this of course means that T is actually not possible. Uh, and then, oh, sorry, I was a bit, <laughs> I was a bit quick. And then we eliminate it. Yeah, from this set, we drop T. We actually uh, uh, don't consider it possible anymore. And now we go in terms. We 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 have now deleted a type from from T. T might also have adjacent edges that might lead us to drop other types we have considered possible, and so on and so forth. And of course, we need to do the same also for incoming edges, not just for outgoing edges, because of, we have ALCI speaks in both directions. And at the end of the, that process, um, we uh, return uh, that A0, our candidate here, is an answer to the, to the, well, to the query uh, on the unravel database, which is what we want to compute, the approximate answers. Um, if for all surviving types for the point A0 that we're interested in as the answer, um, we have that um, the, the actual query, this is the, the, the actual um, atomic query that we query for, this is A0, is in the type. And if at least one type survives that does not have A0, then we will say, no, sorry, this uh, is not an answer. 
And that's it for tree CQs. We have found our elimination algorithm. Um, so what has happened here? Where is actually where did we actually use the approximate database? Yes, I all I or the, the unraveled database. I always only spoke about the original database here. Yeah. So isn't this just answering the original ontology mediated query? What I'm doing here? Um, no, it's not. Uh, if you, uh, for example, uh, think again of three colorability, yes, you have an ontology mediated query that can express three colorability, um, and you take this triangle, yeah, uh, um, then, um, well, of course, I mean, uh, this is not three colorable, um, but, um, sorry, garbage, this is three colorable, what am I saying? Okay, I shouldn't have used it. Triangle. Take any structure. Take the four click. Something that is not three colorable. Yes. <laughs> um, so the answer to the original query will be yes, because there's a complication. Yes, it's not three colorable. Yeah. Um, uh, but this here will not. I mean, this algorithm. This will be fine. Yes, because we consider every edge in isolation. We always only consider every edge in isolation and check. Do we find matching types for this edge, and for this point, and for this point? Yeah. Yes, we do. Do we find them um, for this? Again, imagine the four click. Um, do we find it for this? And so on. So locally, everything is fine. That's what we check. But this doesn't mean that we find a type assignment that is fine for the entire four click. Yes. In fact, we won't. Um, so this is by looking only always at, and this is happening here. Yes. By only looking at two types that are connected by an edge. In this way, we what we really do here is consider the unraveling of the database and not the database itself. Without constructing the unraveling, because we can't. Okay. Well, maybe briefly arguing for correctness. Um, for every consonant in the database and type T, um, we want to argue that uh, T has survived if and only if there's a model M of D and O of the database and the ontology that realizes the type at that point. And for the if direction, we would just show by induction on the number of elimination rounds that um, uh -huh, this should be approximate model, of course. Sorry for that. Um, we would just show by induction on the number of elimination rounds that no type realized in M is ever eliminated. So whenever we take any concrete model yeah, of the database, of the unravel database and the ontology, then all types that are realized in there will always survive all our elimination rounds. Um, and if that model uh, happens to make the query false, um, then the final check will actually succeed. Uh, only if you know, we take a type uh, that has survived, and now we build a model M as follows. We assign types to nodes in the unraveled database top down. We start with a root, and at the root, now a type has survived that makes the query false. Yeah, we start with that type. And then because the unraveled database is a tree, we can just go top down step by step. We know that every single edge is so to speak consistent. We can always find a type that extends one edge, yeah. we keep going uh, at infinitum uh, to build our model. Okay. Uh, this is not quite the linear time that I had promised. If you do this naively, you do not get linear time. I only want to hint at linear time uh, how to do it. Um, you can express the whole type elimination process, which is something relatively simple, right? Um, you can express this in horn logic. You can write a propositional horn formula uh, that basically just expresses this elimination process. And uh, by computing then, or def well, deciding in linear time the, the validity of this formula, you can actually get to, to this time mark. But even if you do it naively, yeah, you, you end up with something polynomial in the data. Uh, so we, we did achieve p-time data complexity here. Okay, um, so we know in ALCI with three conjunctive queries, yes, uh, 
Here, lie ontology relaxing approximate answers can be evaluated in p-time data complexity. That's, that's already nice. We have achieved our goal, uh, even in linear time. That's maybe even a bit more than we had hoped. Um, uh, so far, we are limited to three queries. So uh, one last step that I would like to make is from tree queries to arbitrary conjunctive queries. Um, how can we do that? And um, to do this, uh, we somehow uh, have to use a much more careful version of the chase. And this is also related to what Benny asked in the first uh, block of the tutorial, the infiniteness of the chase. How can you tame that? Well, this approach here also tames the infinity of the chain. It was originally proposed by Megan and Koch. Um, OK, so uh, the point is that um, we somehow want to work with the chase. Um, the chase is infinite. But if we know the query that we want to answer, and here we do know the query that we want to answer, um, then we don't need all these infinite trees in the chase. Really, only a small fragment of these trees suffice. You know? Think of the query, again, we know it, that we want to answer, and any homomorphism, of course, there can be many homomorphisms, a homomorphic image in the chase. Um, and uh, the, the stuff that we're interested in is here the overlap of the, of, the, of the homomorphic image of the query with the trees. And because your true query is small, these will, will also be small. Um, that's somehow the intuition. So um, what we care about is the excursions of the query, or rather its homomorphic image, into the trees that the chase has attached to uh, your data. How do we identify those? Well, we consider the following set of three conjunctive queries. We start from the original query Q. Then we identify variables in it in any possible way that corresponds to the identification by homomorphisms. Homomorphisms don't need to be injective, so they also, in a sense, identify variables. This is what we do here. Then we take a subquery that's cutting off here. Yeah, we only use this part of the query. Um, and uh, if this gives you a tree CQ, then you include it in the set of conjunctive queries that, uh, that I'm defining. And these conjunctive queries viewed as subtrees of the chase are all that we really need to know about the chase. Yeah? So this, is, this identifies the parts of the chase that I could possibly ever be interested in for answering this particular query. You recognize your approach? Or maybe a little bit, no? <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I want to define this more careful chase, a Q directed chase, I called it here. Let's assume for simplicity that our conjunctive query is connected and that it is not Boolean. This is something, of course, that is very reasonable in practice. Um, and um, let us take an ontology, a database, and a conjunctive query. Then, how do I obtain this careful version of the chase denoted in this way here? Well, we start with a database, and then we just add these relevant, uh, these yeah, relevant tree-shaped queries from the set that we had identified, uh, wherever they happened to be implied. So we consider all constants from the database. We consider all of these finitely many queries that we're interested in. Uh, and whenever they are implied, yes, we need an algorithm for, for query entailment here, of course, yeah, but it's in ELI, um, then um, we will just put it there. Now, this is, of course, a model of the database. It extends the database, not necessarily of the ontology, um, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the important point is that it's an, a universal structure, um, not for all conjunctive queries anymore, like the original chase, but for the conjunctive query that we want to answer. So this is uh, summarized by this lemma here. Um, if O is an ELI ontology and D a database, then um, the answers to the query on the uh, Q chase, on the carefully chase, is missing a Q database um, with the ontology, are just the answers that we want to get, the answers to the ontology mediated query. So to Q, 
and the database and the ontology taken together. Okay, and this is all we need to lift the algorithm from three conjunctive queries to real conjunctive queries. Um, so also there, ELI ontology relaxing approximate answers can be evaluated in p-time, the main result from approximation that I wanted to show you. Um, what do we have to do? We only have to compute this query-directed chase. Um, the chase uh, for the query queue that we want to answer. But now with the infinite approximation ontology. Yes. And then when we, once we have done that, um, because we know that this gives the right answer. Yeah? This is the infinite ontology, the infinite approximation ontology that we are constructing. And then once we have done that, we can just forget the ontology. We just answer Q directly over the chase database using any, any procedure. Yeah? And of course, this you can do in p-time data complexity, even in, in AC0, yeah? not a problem. But now, how do we compute this? So we are back to the back to the approximation ontology. Had we already got rid of that? Yes, exactly. We had got rid of that already. Yes, from the first part uh, of this result, where we dealt only with three CQs. This is exactly what we had been deciding. So for building this chase here, this query-directed chase. Uh, what do we have to do? We have to check whether certain tree CQs are implied at certain places in the database for the um, approximation ontology. And this is just what we already have seen. We are able to do it even in linear time. So we build this model here in P time, and then we answer the uh, conjunctive query. Over it. So it's a bit of a two step process. Yeah? The tree CQs, they are very important. I didn't single them out just because they are easier, but they are uh, an important puzzle piece in constructing uh, the model that we need for answering unrestricted conjunctive queries. Um, and once we have our algorithms for tree CQs, uh, we can basically just use it. Yeah? We, have the, we have the database which we leave intact, we are not touching the database. We can't, yes, we must answer unrestricted CQs over it now. Yeah, we cannot unravel the database. It's not possible with CQs, of course. Um, uh, but we attach all these trees to it that the ontology entails, the approximated ontology entails. Um, and then we just answer. Now let's generalize a little bit. Um, so, so far we've approximated in ELI. Now, uh, well, why do we want to uh, restrict ourselves to that? Uh, we might want to use a more uh, powerful approximation language um, that uh, still attains uh, p-time data complexity. Um, so we could use tuple generating dependencies uh, or uh, suitable restriction thereof. So top of the generating dependencies, I assume you've also seen already during the tutorial. Yes, okay. I don't need to say a lot about it. Well, you could think maybe unrestricted tuple generating dependencies, uh, uh, you can use them, yes? Uh, why not? I mean, they are undecidable, but you're, you're starting from an ALCI ontology, yeah? So maybe if you approximate with unrestricted, maybe it is decidable. Um, Yes, I think it is decidable, but it doesn't approximate. That's the problem. Yeah, there is no approximation if you do this, and therefore no p-time data complexity. So um, uh, if you take any ontology-mediated query from our language of interest, LCI and CQs, um, then uh, for every sigma database um, and every tuple, yeah, the, the TGD approximation ontology will just contain the implication the database implies a query. Yeah, we'll just write that into the ontology for all possible databases and all possible, well, all possible queries we, for the query that we need, basically. Yeah. Even for all possible queries, but the one that we need is enough. And therefore, there's, there's no approximation, right? This just, I mean, this just gives me all answers. If I now evaluate Q with respect to this ontology here, and of course, I just get the, the, the right answer. 
So this is too much, yes? We need to resort to some restricted fragment of TGDs to get approximation. And uh, what we uh, have chosen here is uh, frontier one TGDs. So this means that there's at most one variable that is shared between the rule body and the rule head. We could also use frontier guarded. That would make things technically uh, more involved. I think little is gained in terms of completeness, but in principle, uh, you, can, you can do that. Um, okay, so what about frontier one? Well, unfortunately, that's still not good enough. Mm, you are now approximating, but um, uh, if you approximate your ontology with frontier one TGDs, so this is what this means, then approximate answers are still co and p complete to evaluate. And the argument is essentially the same as before. Um, well, let's now only look at uh, non free colorability. Yeah? So we know we have an ontology mediated query for that. Well, then the ontology contains for every non three colorable graph, uh, graph implies uh, exists xp of x. Um, P was the problem, uh, I mean, was, was our, our, our uh, predicate that, that indicated a problem. Yeah. Well, and then you also the predicate, of course, that we query for. And therefore, I mean, it's just the same argument as before. You know, the approximate ontology still expresses non three colorability, and therefore it's going to be hard. Well, that's also not good. We need to do more. And uh, what can you do more? Well, uh, we consider Frontier 1 TGDs, uh, which additionally impose bounds on the tree width of the rule body and on the tree width of the rule heads. Um, and this small observation here shows increasing the value, so this thing about three colorability, increasing the value of the tree with bound on the rule bodies, this gives you more and more complete approximation. What would you expect in ELI in our very, very basic language, our tree language, if you approximate the three colorability or non-three colorability query with it, what would you expect to get? You're expecting, no, uh, you're approximating non-three colorability in terms of a language that and only speak about trees. You get the empty query. <laughs> it will never return any answers because every tree is three colorable. <laughs> it will never give you anything. This changes here. Yeah? So uh, if you make you the bound of the tree with uh, the bodies larger and larger, it will capture more and more graphs that are not three colorable in your rule bodies, yeah? and you will get more and more answers. So this is what I meant when I said that it gives you an infinite hierarchy of more and more complete answers to do, to do something like this. Okay, in contrast, the bound on the tributes of the rule heads is not strictly needed. Uh, we do it because it improves the combined complexity, but I'm not going to speak about that a lot. Um, Okay, and then actually you can lift the results that I've shown you. Um, uh, you can lift them from ELI to uh, TGD KL ontologies. So again, it's frontier one ontologies with a constant bound K on the tree width of the rule bodies, a constant bound L on the tree width of the rule heads. And it's essentially the same proof. You have to unravel databases, now not into trees anymore, but into structures of tree width K. Um, in the construction of the uh, Q directed chase, you don't attach trees anymore, you attach again structures of bounded tree width, uh, and so on. Um, you don't get linear time anymore for tree CQs, uh, but you still get something like fixed parameter tractability as the size of the query with your parameter. Okay, then let me maybe briefly mention. Uh, I mean, I've now spoken a lot about uh, approximating by relaxing the ontology. Let me now briefly speak about uh, the other approach, namely relaxing the database, something you can also do, right? Uh, actually, this can be defined uh, also in a very natural way that parallels the ontology-based approximation. So what you do is you would first choose a class of databases B on which CQ evaluation is in P time and data complexity. 
what doesn't make any sense. On which O and Q evaluation is in P time in data complexity, sorry, <laughs> uh, not CQ. Um, and in particular, I mean, just think of bounded retrievers. Yeah, that's really the only candidate that really makes sense here. And now let us define what the database relaxing approximations are. So, um, ah, sorry. So what I now, what we now take is um, we take all databases D prime from the chosen class of databases that admit a homomorphism into the database D that we are really interested in. Um, then evaluate, we evaluate the original OMQ. We don't, we don't approximate any anymore at all in terms of the ontology mediated theory. Yes. We originate, we evaluate them on all these databases D prime. Um, and then we just uh, take the union of all answers. And this is very parallel to the ontology approximation case. Now we have infinitely many candidates for our database D prime, but again, this is only a semantics. Nobody tells us we should really materialize those or go through all of them, yeah? So far, it only gives us a notion of approximation. And as I said before, an important case is, I mean, the important case is uh, classes of databases of some uh, tree with band Okay. Okay. Yes, so, uh, and how do you approach this? Just two slides on this. Um, how do you approach this? Uh, well, um, as I already mentioned before, you can now unravel databases into uh, databases of bounded tree -wiz. So basically you start with your original database and then you look at all sub databases um, whose size is bounded by the constant K that you have fixed for your tree with. And then you put all these sub databases as roots of the tree. You look at all overlapping databases, you put them as successors and you keep going and it's the same unraveling process as before with the trees, but now it's for uh, a bounded tree with structure. Um, Okay, and this unraveled database is important because it is the strongest among all homomorphic preimages of D. So whenever I take any database from the class that I've chosen, uh, databases of tree with at most K, then if D prime uh, maps to D homomorphically, then it maps to this unraveling. Yeah. And what this means is we can again do the same step as for the ontologies. We had infinitely many databases, finite databases. We can replace it by a single infinite database, it parallels that case, yes, uh, um, uh, which, which gives the same answer. And this is just the unraveling. So instead of evaluating on all the finite databases that map into D, we can just use this infinite unraveling data. Okay, and once we've done that, we can give an algorithm for this. So this is very similar actually, right? It's very similar to what we had before with ontology approximating, uh, with the ontology approximation case. We have to evaluate our original query on some unraveled database. Um, okay. The idea of the algorithm is uh, similar to the type elimination algorithm that we had seen before. Uh, intuitively, the type elimination, as I had tried to emphasize here, yeah, it considers only one edge in your database at the time. Yeah? Every edge is considered in a database independently and to make sure the types are okay with respect to that edge. Um, here, you would consider K elements at the time where K is the tree with bounds. You will always look at fragments of your database, parts of your database uh, that consist of K elements and you would check, uh, can I find a type assignment? within this part of the database uh, that is uh, satisfiable. Um, and um, if not, then you remove the corresponding type. Yes. One different to the other case though, is that this is now done directly for conjunctive queries, not only for three conjunctive queries.
Okay, let me let me maybe relate the two and then uh, come to the third, to my third topic to say a few words about that. Um, so how do they relate, ontology relaxing and database relaxing? Well, actually they are incomparable. Um, uh, ontology relaxing approximations, I think, are the better choice. Um, they are conservative over conjunctive queries, by which I mean that um, if you answer your conjunctive query without any ontology over your data, then you're guaranteed to preserve all these answers in the uh, approximated case with the ontology. Yeah? You never lose any answers to the pure conjunctive query. If you view your ontology as delivering additional answers, then this is what you want, right? You don't want to, I mean, you might, might want to approximate to get to better data complexity, but when doing this, you don't want to lose any of the really central answers that you're sure about even without the ontology. And this is achieved by the, um, by the ontology approximating approximate. Why? Remember how we build our query directed chase. Yeah, this, um, this model here that somehow looks like this, you know, the small triangles. Um, we build it by starting with the original database D uh, and then attaching some things. So for sure we only get more answers than when answering directly over the database D, but not less. This is not the case for database relaxing approximations uh, because there, I mean, we, we unravel the database or the whole conjunctive query, yes? So if we take tree with one, we would still get a tree unraveling and we answer our conjunctive query over the tree unraveling of the database and we will lose a hell of a lot of answers. Conversely, um, database relaxing approximations are complete if the database has small tree width, for example, if it's a path, um, but ontology relaxing approximations are not complete over small tree width. Um, yes, maybe um, I'll leave it at this. I had the concrete example, but maybe I go to this, which looks like this. Um, but maybe I go to the third part. Um, I read, take a breath. <laughs> Me in particular. <laughs> no, actually, this was a bit too sudden. Let me ask, is there anything before, before I switch? Is there, is there any questions on the approximation part? No. Not just directly. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, I I think it's the ontology one. That's what I tried to say on my last whoops, um, on my last slide. Um, well, not this slide, is it? This slide here. I, to me, this this slide pretty much gives the answer. So um, the ontology they, they are more conservative, more careful. I think the ontology approximating ones, because as I said, the the answers to the original conjunctive query over the database without any ontologies, which is the baseline, I think, right? That, so you don't want to get worse than this. You don't want to lose any answers by putting an ontology, in my opinion. Yes. And this is the case uh, for, for, for the ontology approximating case. Uh, for the database approximating case, um, unless you, I mean, of course, you can, you don't lose answers if you choose your tree with large enough. Yeah? So it's larger than, the, than your query, then you're okay. But then also I think you're very inefficient. Um, that's one reason. I think they are much more well behaved. Um, I can also, would also expect that if you try, my algorithms are not practical, of course, that I showed here. But if you implement this in practice, I would expect that those are much better 
for, for actual implementation. And if you look at, do I have something to look at? I, okay, I didn't want to show you the table. Now I'll show you the table. <laughs> um, if you look at the overall complexities, they come out much better, um, I think, um, because they also lower the combined complexity. So this is, let's not look at all of this. Yeah, this is terrible. Let's just look at some of this. This is the case with no approximation. The combined complexity is often very high for this kind of languages. When you do the ontology approximating, uh, uh, version, you go down also in combined complexity and in data complexity, which I think is, is quite nice. Um, whereas for the database unraveling ones, there are weird effects. You uh, sometimes even go up in uh, combined complexity. So you go down in data and you go up in combined. Um, that's a bit baroque, I think, and I, I, I'm pretty much in favor of, of, the, of the first case. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, yeah. That's a good good question. I mean, it's natural to consider click with, for example. Uh, why not? And um, I, I didn't think it through to the end. My my impression was that there is nothing to be gained there. That the data complexity would still be Cohen p. So I think you can. So for click with. Um, mm, What's the first step? The first step is this unraveling into a database of bounded tree widths would have to replace, be, be replaced with something appropriate that is now formulated in terms of click widths. Yes, so like a maximal homomorphic pre-image of a certain bounded click widths. I think you can find and construct such a thing, but it would be, a, there's, there are sort of choices in constructing it. And in the end, you take the disjoint union over all the choices and I think then you can prove coin PR. I, I, yes, I would expect coin PR in that to make it short. Yeah. Andreas. Huh? Yeah. Can you say again? Sorry. Um, yes, I would, I would suspect that uh, depending on, this should be extremely close to monadic data log rewritability, maybe even the same. Um, of course, monadic data log is not the same as ELI, but I suspect that the additional expressive power maybe doesn't help you here. Um, and I think we even looked at the ELI rewrite. I, I can maybe answer later. Yes. So I, yeah, I think that we, we have a result in some on, on this. And I think it's close to the monadic data. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anything else on approximation? Okay. Then let me maybe give you an impression for more, I don't, don't have time, of enumeration, because I thought this might fit in nicely. We already had a tutorial, right, on uh, enumerating the answers to conjunctive queries. So, um, uh, which is a very nice topic. So uh, I thought I can say a few words about, oh, I had hoped for more than a few words, but uh, about um, uh, enumerating answers now to ontology mediated queries. Yes. So the problem that I will look at is uh, we take an ontology mediated query in the database and we don't want to enumerate all the answers one after the other without repetition. Again, you know this. And I will focus on enumeration in this class, well, with, with constant delay and linear pre processing. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and um, of course, this is referring to data complexity. Um, so in the case uh, of just normal conjunctive queries, or which uh, Nicole has, uh, has considered, so the query is fixed. In our case, 
also the query is fixed, the entire ontology mediated query, both the actual query and the ontology are fixed and their size is a constant. Um, so are you, um, so you, you had the tutorial and it's clear what I mean by this without going into more detail or? No? Okay, some modern, yes. Yes. Um, remember that we have our two notions, also uh, just a rehearsal from, you can refresh your memory from, uh, from Nicole's tutorial. Uh, we have our two notions, uh, our two structural properties of conjunctive queries that are closely related to uh, uh, enumeration in CDLIN. One is acyclicity of the query. I'm not having ontologies at the moment. It's just, just pure conjunctive query. One is acyclicity, meaning that the query has a joint tree, and the other is what I call free connect acyclicity. Um, Nicole might have used this a little bit differently. I'm not sure, yes. Um, meaning that uh, the query becomes acyclic after you have added an atom that covers all the answer variables. Okay. And you know that these are very intimately related to enumeration in CDLIN. Um, and then they are a reminder. So this would be a query that is cyclic, not free connect acyclic, because if we add an edge between these two variables here, then we have a cycle. This guy is not acyclic, obviously, but it's free connect acyclic because all variables are enter variables. So if I add now a cycle, then uh, trivially acyclic. Ah, you are here. <laughs> yeah, that's what I what I speculated about. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, that, that's true. And, and that's important for some of our results, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. And well, the, the, the baseline result that I'm sure that Nicole has shown and explained um, is this one, right? For conjunctive queries that I cyclic and free connect cyclic enumeration is in CDLIN. And yes. Uh, uh, there's an excellent tutorial uh, on this. Uh, actually, it was a great help also for, for our work in this area. Um, and what I would like to do is let me remind you in my own presentation, let me give a brief walkthrough of that algorithm again, um, uh, and then um, uh, tell you what changes if you add the ontology, if you go to ontology mediated queries. Um, actually, I think my presentation might be different from Nicole, so I think I should really first walk again through the base case. <laughs> um, okay, so again, this is just a high level summary. Um, if your query is acyclic and free connects acyclic, then what this gives you is that you can find a joint tree of your query. Not quite true, it's a generalized hypertree decomposition of this one, but I dropped that. Yes, a joint tree of your query. Um, in which the prefix contains exactly the answer variables. So this is the prefix of the join tree. The red guys are the answer variables. They are all over the place. But there's a prefix of the join tree that uh, contains exactly the answer variables. And this is what these two structural conditions taken together give you. And now this join tree is a nice tool for enumeration of the answers. Um, so the red part is the one that has the answer variables. So the first thing that we do, in my view at least, is to materialize the relevant relations from the database in the nodes of the joint tree. So we do a single scan through the database and we put the relations, the relevant relations into every node. This is about S. Uh, so we collect all the S tuples from the database, maybe also the variable pattern or the reoccurrence pattern is important, forget it. We just take all the S patterns and we put them into this node. Here we put all the R patterns. And so on. Then we do a bottom-up pass over the joint tree that builds a semi-join between parents and children. So in a sense, we look at the shared variables between adjacent nodes, and we identify pairs that can never be extended 
in a actually top-down run. So for example here, um, X is a shared variable between the two nodes. So we would realize that A is compatible with some tuple here, putting A into the X position. Putting B is not because there's no tuple here that has B in the X position, so we would drop it. That's the standard join. Once you've done that, you would drop all the parts of your join tree except this nice prefix that has all the answer variables. Why? Because the bottom-up path building the semi-join has ensured you that you can extend every mapping. If you come from the top, you can extend every mapping to, uh, to the remaining parts of the tree, to the quantified variables in particular. And where you map those, you don't care. Yeah? So this is why you drop this. You know you can map them. Then you do a pre-order tree work. This was all pre-processing, by the way. Yes. Now uh, comes uh, the enumeration phase. You do a pre-order tree work uh, to assemble the answers. You output at the final node and you backtrack. So let's give an example. Here we have SAB and SAC, and here we also have some tuples. So we would maybe first select, select SAB. Um, then we would go to the next node. Well, there's only one here. We would look for the compatible matching tuples the shared variables again x, so we need an a, if we started with s, a, b, we need an a in the first position, and we would choose maybe this, and we have our first answer, which is a, b, c. Uh, we would go back and choose, so well, there's nothing to choose here, we would choose s, a, c, and uh, so on. And because of the uh, building of the semi-joints um, uh, before, we know that we never get stuck, we can always uh, carry on, and at the end, we will always have something to output. Now, to achieve all this in constant delay, this uh, relies, of course, on some clever pre-computing uh, of some indexes. So in particular, when you come from here and you go to the next node to find the matching tuple, um, you cannot just go through this list one by the other. That would be linear. It would not be constant, yes. Um, so uh, you need to have an index. Uh, on uh, this sub database here to find the, the given an assignment to the shared variables to find the matching tuples, the right tuples. And for this, you pre compute an index uh, with which you can do in linear time if you use the right machine model. Is this somehow in line with what you did? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Again, I didn't mean to explain it completely here with this. Yes, it's more remote. Okay. And now I would like to generalize this to ontology mediated queries. And here, uh, what is my setup? Um, uh, I, I, I'm moving to a different world here now. Sorry for that. <laughs> so um, it's not uh, uh, ALCI is not used as the ontology language. I think there's very little hope for understanding CDLIN for ALCI queries. Um, so what I do here is my actual queries are conjunctive queries, and the ontologies that I add on top of the conjunctive queries, they are sets of guarded tuple generating dependencies. So tuple generating dependencies, you know, you told me guarded is also clear, or is it not? You don't think we've seen it. Good. Okay. Then I should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. This happens when you jump over things. I should. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Hello? Good. Okay. So, um, again, tuple generating dependencies, just implications between conjunctions of atoms. Yes, with existential quantification in the head. And, uh, we need to, to, to get decidability for ontology-mediated querying. Uh, you need to tame them somehow, unrestricted TBDC to undecidability. And uh, one way to tame them is this guardedness condition. And this simply requires that your rule body will contain one atom that has all the variables that occur in the rule body. Yeah? So this rule body contains the variables x, y, z. And indeed, here you have an atom that contains all of these variables. This is the guardedness condition. And this is one way, not the only one, but one way to attain uh, decidability of ontology-mediated querying. 
if you use TGDs as the ontology, yeah, and I'm now transitioning to the case where I use uh, TGDs as the ontology, also higher arity relations are allowed, all that uh, is, is now possible. This is what I would like to study here. Sorry, I, I, I don't know. I never messed up a tutorial so much like this. <laughs> 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 yeah, I go too much back and forth and skip and stuff. I really just have my slide. Um, good. So what do I want to do? Um, yes, this is the result that we want to prove. Yes, um, we now look instead of, like in the Colts tutorial, instead of conjunctive queries, we now want to look at ontology mediated queries, which have conjunctive queries extended with the uh, ontology that has garbage TGD. And the condition is uh, the same as before. Uh, so uh, the query should be, the actual query should be acyclic and free connect acyclic. And then this is what we want to show. Enumeration is still in CD lib. And this is a quite a significant generalization, I would say, of the basic CQ case, because now we have the ontology, which of course extends the expressive power of the, the query. For example, it also includes uh, recursive queries. Now in the ontology, you can uh, uh, um, imply, you can implement recursion. So for example, if you, if you write it in ELI, yes, you would just write something like this, and then you query for a of x. That would be a recursive query. Give me all points that uh, along an R pass reach an object that makes a true, something like this. Okay. Yes. Um, of course, the chase again plays an important role. Now we chase with guarded TGDs. Um, the chase database looks similar to what I've shown you before. The database itself, together with trees below it. Uh, now it's not real trees anymore because we have TGDs, but it's um, a, a bounded tree with structures. And the bound is the, the diameter of the head of your, of your TGD. Yes. Okay. Um, for reduced, well, Um, for the theorem that I've just shown you, uh, actually, there's a very easy way, I would say, to prove it. And this is to reduce out ontologies completely and then use as a black box an enumeration algorithm that we have used before. So when you're lucky with ontology mediated queries, then you can do this. You can just get rid of the ontology. And how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to use again the same finite fragment of the chase that we've used before. We identify the relevant parts of the trees that we need for evaluating the query that we want to evaluate. Um, we then start with the database and add all these trees. It will be finite. Um, and the nice thing is it can be computed even in linear time. Um, and how do we do this? Well we describe the, uh, this partial chase, this very careful chase here, this is what I call the partial chase. Yes. We describe it by the way to construct it by, well, just representing the uh, chase rules as rules, again, in uh, propositional horn logic. So we construct, in the end, a propositional horn formula theta that in a way, represents the building of this careful chase. Then we compute the minimal model for this uh, slightly mysterious now horn formula theta. And from that, we can actually read off the chase uh, uh, that we have uh, constructed. So as part of the linear pre-processing phase, yeah, we can construct this uh, data structure um, that basically puts the ontology into the data then we can forget the ontology and uh, enumerate the answers on the partial chase using a black box procedure. Okay, that's always good. Um, that's, that's nice, yeah, it's very easy. 
it gives you uh, a generalization of the CD Lin result. Yeah, um, it's also a bit boring. Uh, I mean, we didn't do much. We didn't learn anything about enumeration. Um, we just we just reduce out the ontology. So things become a little bit more interesting uh, when you introduce uh, and study a different notion of answers, partial answers, which I think make a lot of sense, in particular in combination with enumeration. So um, what do I mean? Uh, answers can now have this form here. So they are a mix of database constants on the one hand and wildcards on the other hand. And intuitively wildcards denote some constant which we know must be there, but the exact identity is unknown. Yeah? So the existential quantifier in the ontology, quantifiers in the ontology, they can introduce in the chase fresh database objects. We know that they are there, but we don't know what they are. Yes. So here's a super trivial example to uh, illustrate what I mean, why I want this. My ontology could say, if X is a researcher, then uh, X has an office. And maybe the data says, Mary is a researcher. And now the query says, well, please give me all researchers together with their offices. Now with the standard answers, of course, I don't get any, yeah? Because I know that Mary must have an office, but I don't know what it is, so I cannot return it, right? Um, but I get a partial answer. The partial, yeah. and that's definitely more normative uh, than giving no answer. So uh, uh, to me, this is a very natural variation of the usual answer to ontology mediated. Um, and what we want to produce in the end is not just any partial answers, but we want to produce minimal partial answers. So with this, I mean, I want partial answers that, such that there is no strictly more informative answer. So in particular, I do not want to return a partial answer if I still have an answer after taking out a wildcard and replacing with a concrete database constant. Yeah? This would be redundant. This I, I don't want to have. I would just flood the user with, with weird answers. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it does make sense without enumeration. Um, I think it has not been studied because uh, if you're just interested in testing a single answer, uh, it rarely makes a difference. There, I mean, for very simple logics, which have polytime combined complexity, some of them exist, yes, that this ma makes, an, makes a difference. Yeah, there are some rare cases where it makes a difference, but for the majority of cases that are studied in the description of the community, at least, it does not make a difference. Um, you can't just somehow, well, you just take all sub-queries where you replace all possible subsets of variables with quantified variables, answer those, somehow put things together. If your complexity is very high anyway, then this will just be eaten up. Yeah, so. <laughs> no. Okay, so these minimal partial answers, this is what uh, we are interested in now. And um, here is another result. It's almost exactly the same as before. We again look at conjunctive queries and guarded tuple generating dependencies. Same acyclicity and free connect acyclicity condition. Um, but in you, uh, and it says now enumerating minimally partial answers is in is in Cedillion. So also this is a positive result. Also this we can enumerate in Cedillion. Naive approaches will not work. Yes. So. Uh, for example, so what can we do now? Yeah, in our pre-order tree walk in the enumeration phase, when we actually compute the answers, what could we do? We could put wildcards there. That's a bad idea. If you put a wildcard there and you want to build the next join, you cannot build the next join because you only have a wildcard. You don't know where you are in your database and what you can join with it. Um, we can put the existential constants there, not putting the wildcards, but the existential constants and only replacing at the end with wildcards. That also won't work uh, because if you do that, you will produce a lot of answers multiple times. Yes. Um, the identity of the objects is not important. Yes? So you need to do something. So what can we do? Well, here's a summary, central ideas of the enumeration algorithm. And then I come back to my picture and try to give you an intuition. Um, I think I will fit into almost into the five minutes that I still have. Oh, 10 minutes. Ah, that's great. 
So central ideas of the enumeration algorithms are like this, yes? In the, in the pre-processing phase, we start with doing exactly the same as in the original algorithm. We construct first the partial chase of the database, yeah? To get rid of the ontology, basically. Um, and then we execute all pre-processing steps that we also have in the, in the very basic result, yes? Uh, we materialize all the relations in our join tree, we build the semi-joins, we remove the quantified variables. Same thing, yeah? Only on a different database, namely this partially chased database. Okay. Um, then still in the pre-processing phase, we do more. Now we need to address the wildcards. And the wildcards are sort of about excursions of the query, especially about answer variables, parts of the query that have answer variables into the existential part of the chase, yes? We still have here, this is our chase, and now some answer variables might map here, and then we will want to put a wildcard into this position. And for dealing with that, we will consider all possible excursions, I will make this precise in a sec, of the query into the existential part of the chase, and arrange these uh, in the form of excursion trees, which we put into suitable data structures. I will explain it. And then we will use these trees to produce the wildcard parts of the answer and to prune. Uh, we will also have a pruning step in the end for minimality. So here's probably the better explanation. Um, let's say this is our join tree. And this is our join tree after we have already removed the quantified variables. Yeah? So all these are answer variables. Now, what we will do in the pre-processing phase is we will consider all possible excursion trees. What is an excursion tree? Well, something like this, yeah? It's a subtree of the join tree that describes an excursion into these existential parts of the chase. How does it do that? Well, let's look at the beginning, for example, of the excursion, excursion tree. I try to give an intuition, yes? So the shared variable here is x. Only x is the shared variable. Uh, sorry, x and y are both <laughs> garbage. x and y are the shared variables, yes? And u is a fresh variable. But x and y are both mapped to database constants, and u is mapped to some chase constant. So when I go from here to here, an excursion starts, yeah? x and y, database constants, u, existential tree. Okay, now u is also here, so here the excursion proceeds. Um, these guys share only x, now it's true, <laughs> which is mapped to a database constant. So here the excursion stops. So this must not be part of the database tree, uh, of the excursion tree, sorry. <clears throat> well, and similar. So there are a couple of conditions that make sure that this really is in sync with, uh, 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 with, uh, with what we want to achieve. And these excursion trees must, of course, be justified by homomorphisms. So this is only, uh, an excursion tree if there exists a homomorphism of this subquery into the database that supports this pattern here that I have put, put there. Yeah? These are, if it's not a valid pattern, then I will not consider the excursion tree. Actually, um, if you look carefully and define them in, a, in the right way, it's easy to screw that up, <laughs> but if you define it in the right way, then you can do it such that the number of excursion trees is linear. Yeah? And this is with the annotation, with the constants. Yeah? This is why you must be careful not to screw it up because you have many variables and you put the database constants to it. Uh, but still, yeah, if you are very careful, you will only have a linear number of excursion trees in total. In the pre-processing phase, we compute lists of all such excursion trees um, with a suitable index structure again. So what is the index structure? Basically, it tells me uh, if I am at a certain node in the join tree, it would be V here, yeah? Um, and I have a certain uh, mapping for the overlapping variables, X and Y. So X and Y are mapped to C1 and C2. Then I get a list of the join trees that have root V and where, well, X and Y are mapped to this value. You know, this is, this is a put in an index structure that I can easily access the tree. And um, this list must not be in an arbitrary order. This relates to the minimality of the answers, of the partial answers that we want to get. But rather, we have to sort them in a database-preferring order. 
this just means that we prefer database constants over stars. So if, or wildcards, yes? So if uh, two excursion trees are basically the same, except that one has um, uh, database constants in places where other have stars, then we would prefer uh, the first. Okay. Now what, would, what do we do with these things? In the enumeration phase, the excursion trees give us chunks of the joint tree that we will process together in one step. So it's a little bit like jumping in our pre-order tree walk. So for example, what does our pre-order tree walk do? We start at the root. Then we transition to this node. And here we might decide that instead of just going step by step, we now put here the entire joint tree. So all these four nodes, we will, we will decide that this, this excursion tree is the one that we actually use. Um, and we will fix that for the answer to be produced. Yeah? So all these guys are now already fixed. And then we sort of jump over it. We would next process this node here, jump, next process this node, jump, next process this node. Of course, we do not only, I mean, here we use only one excursion tree. In a concrete query and enumeration, we could combine different excursion trees. They might not overlap, of course, or they, they must not overlap, but we can have several. That's basically the enumeration phase. Um, and then there's also the, the pruning, the last ingredient here, which happens after each output. So assume that we have completed our our walk over the tree and we have assembled an answer. Yes, so the blue part is an answer. This we would output, we would be happy. Um, uh, but now we need to do more um, to ensure that only the minimal partial answers are produced in the end. And this more is that we consider after having output the answer, all subtrees of our joint tree or of our answer, more or less the same thing. Um, these do not need to be excursion trees. Actually, the blue part that I've chosen here is not an excursion tree. Um, doesn't matter. We still consider all subtrees. We consider all possible ways of replacing constants, database constants, with wildcards. Well, here some things have been replaced with wildcards. And now if this is an excursion tree, which it is, um, then we will remove all these excursion trees from the lists that we had pre-computed. Here again, you need some data structures, some index structures, because you cannot just search through the lists to find the trees that you want to remove. Yeah, that would again be linear time, not constant. So again, you need to be able to jump to the places where you find the right trees to, to, uh, to, to. Okay, the basic, I mean, the, the interesting aspect of this enumeration algorithm is to deal with the minimality. That's sort of the challenge, yes? And let me just summarize again uh, how we deal with it. Yes, there are two aspects to it. First, the excursion trees in the pre-processing phase are sorted in database preferring order. Um, and this means that intuitively less partial trees will be output first. And then uh, the pruning uh, after outputting an answer removes sort of dominated excursion trees. And this means that non-minimally partial answers will actually never be produced at all. Okay. Maybe one slide to close. We can take it further. Yes, why stop at this notion of partial answers? You can make it stronger. So uh, you can give an identity to your wildcard. You can uh, have answers, allow answers like this. But now you have multiple wildcards, and this means that, well, if the position is filled with the same wildcard, then it actually represents the same constant. Yes, we don't, still don't know what it is, but there's the same constant in position two and position four, is it four? No, five of this tuple. Whereas if two wildcards have different indices, then they might or might not be the same. Yeah? So we, we add equality, but not inequality. That would be dangerous on, on the wild. And now you can enumerate those. And uh, the result is, well, it still works. But it's still more complicated. 
actually, uh, yeah, it's, it adds a whole new level of, of complications and difficulties uh, uh, over the origin of the algorithm. Yes. Um, yeah, good point. Um, uh, It's not related so much to the enumeration. I, 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 I'm lacking a good number. I, it feels it's incompatible with the ontology. What do you think, Andreas? <laughs> to add inequalities on this. Um, uh, yes. Actually, I, actually, yes, yeah. yes, and probably this is enough of inequality to do it. I didn't think it's, I just felt that this is a no-go, so I didn't think it through to the end, I have to admit. Um, and I, I suspect that what Victor says is right, that even with this kind of inequalities, which is a bit different, yes, maybe it gives rise to understandability. It's could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, I would just like to leave you with this uh, with this impression and say thank you and apologize that I put uh, more definitely much more <laughs> than I could <laughs> cover it was not a wise planning uh, of my tutorial. I hope it was still kind of comprehensible and you got something out of it. That was the uh, question. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, what do you want to do with variety of factors? Uh huh. So, like sampling or something like this? Yes. Uniform sampling. Uh, I don't know. I mean, um, there are some experts on this in the room. Yes. <laughs> Nicole, no far. Uh, I don't know whether no far is here. Huh? I guess my question applies to everything else. I don't know. Yes. I mean, I think it's interesting. I haven't thought about it in, in the ontology-based case. No, no. But but I, I I mean, there are there are many of these. Also, in which order can you enumerate this? Yeah, um, these are interesting questions and natural questions. I find ideally, I would even like the ontology to determine the order somehow to in which I enumerate. I don't know how to do that, but <laughs> it sounds sounds natural to try to find some ontology specific enumeration problems or something like this and uh, yeah i think these are interesting questions i don't have an answer this is a very recent paper just taught two weeks ago three weeks ago mm. exactly Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that's what we initially thought. Oh, it's easy, you just rewrite away the ontology. Uh, well, then you have a UCQ. And for UCQs, of course, it's not properly understood what is the borderline between. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we thought about it and we got a headache out of it. <laughs> that was, yeah, no, this I don't know. I mean, so what what we do? It's a good, actually, a very good question because what we do in a sense is avoiding this rewriting and this UCQ construction. We 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 build around it, trying to find a way around it. That's what gave rise to this algorithm. And whether the approach by the UCQs, I mean, it's natural to try. They are somehow similar, of course. It's not an arbitrary UCQ. Um, whether one can show that this is well behaved for enumeration, I don't know. I would be very interested in knowing, but I don't know. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, 
I'm not sure I understand the question. We do allow constants in the query, yes, but what does it mean? Can they be? If the query has a constant, or the query has a constant, but maybe that constant is not in the database. Ah. Maybe a wildcard can take it. No, uh, not in our definition. No, maybe this is something one can somehow consider, but no, no. In our case, if the query has a constant, then that constant is met. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Uh, lower bounds. <coughs> uh, yeah, there was some more. So that's again the original result. Um, yeah. Ah, I'm sorry. At least show them. Sorry, here. <laughs> um, yes, so um, they are also paralleling the case uh, without ontologies. Um, of course, they're also, uh, they are not completely matching because you need to assume self John freeness. Um, um, we need a little bit more here. Um, uh, we don't have lower bounds for, for guarded GDDs. We can only prove it for, for ELI uh, because for guarded TGDs, if you get a, if you if we got a lower bound for guarded TGDs, then we could also re remove self-joint freeness, of course, yeah, because we can just rename relations completely, uh, also higher hierarchy relations in the ontology. Um, so it's only for ELI. Um, in the second case here, where the query is acyclic but not three connects acyclic, we also need connectedness of the query, which is something that doesn't pop up without ontologies. And it's necessary, we have a counter example. So we have a query that is acyclic, not three connect acyclic and disconnected and can be enumerated in CD Lin. So um, the borderline is a little bit more messy. Also, I should maybe admit that uh, the self joint freeness really helps us. So uh, we exploit it in additional ways um, uh, than in the basic case for only conjunctive queries. So even if somebody managed to remove the self joint freeness from the basic case, I know it cannot be completely removed because one of the there are counter examples known and so on, but if somebody managed to remove it, we would still have a lot of work to lift that to ontologies because we it really makes our life easy to self join <laughs> I mean, maybe not easy, yeah? this, uh, we also have to deal with the ontology in the lower bounds. So it is some non-trivial stuff that is going on there on top of the other lower bounds. Um, but without septum freeness, it looks like a nightmare, frankly, with ontologies. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you.